Hello and welcome back to my channel, What If Deku Tuo. Join us as we delve into the realms of fanfiction and fantasy, bringing you the best stories and discussions. Today, we're kicking off part 19 of our series, What If Everyone Gets Obsessed With Deku and Had Harim? If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content in the future. The author of this story is Guy Number 23 from Fanfiction Net. All the relevant links are in the description. Feel free to say hello to the author on their profile. Now, let's dive into the fanfic. Merry Christmas, cheered the young heroes in training from Class 1A. After a year that felt much longer than it should, full of unexpected turns of events, they were here. The second year was at arm's length and deep down they all felt a little anxious. With all they had been through, one could only wonder what awaited them in the path ahead. But let's not dwell on these thoughts, shall we? At least for today because it was time for commemoration. For surviving this year, for the achievements and lessons learned, there were many reasons. Dressed according to the festivities, the students sat in the common room, chatting and nibbling some food while they waited for their guests from the neighboring classroom. Sai man, I'm so glad they gave us this week to rest. I can't imagine myself going to the work-study right after classes end, Ashido said, stretching her arms up. Yeah, it's good that we can go home for New Year's Eve, right, Mina-chan? Hegekir said, moving her hands in excitement. Yeah, that's cool, but we still have to pick an agency to go. It is kind of a short time, Gyro said. Ribbit, are you going to work with Hawks again, Takoyami-kun? asked the flog girl, properly covered in a layer of warm clothes. I intend to do so if hawks accept me again. I feel that I grew up during my experience there, the bird-headed teen answered. Oh, Takoyami-kun got a small fanbase from his time with hawks, right? That's cool, Yuraraka joined the chat. Meanwhile, Kirishima turned to his explosive friend. Are you going to best genus again, Baku bro? TCH? I don't know, Bakugo replied without much interest. Genist was still recovering from the fight in Kamino. But you still have a lot of contacts from the sports festival, don't you? Kaminari asked, skillfully sneaking around the explosive teen and managing to put a Santa hat on him. Bakugo wasn't exactly in the Christmas spirit, according to Ishido's dress code. And why would I want to learn from a bunch of nameless nobodies? This is the holy night. Why are y'all talking about school? Minta exclaimed, putting his gift among the others in a big pile. Well, Minta is kinder right. Let's just enjoy the food, Sato said, coming from the kitchen with a big roasted chicken in hand. Sugar Man knows how to cook too, the students cheered. Then a knock on the door was heard. Sorry for being late, have you all started already? The tired voice was very known to them, their homeroom teacher, and a little surprise accompanied the scruffy man. Trick or threat, said the gray-haired small girl, looking at the man in black for confirmation. No, no, you got it mixed. It's Santa Eri. The teens exclaimed in unison delight at the sight of Eri, dressed in a Christmas-themed dress with gloves and a hat to match. H, how cute, Yuraraka said, fawning over Eri-chan. It looks so well in you, Eri-chan. Midoriya was quick to compliment once he spotted her. Did Tagata Senpai come too? Kirishima asked excitedly. I told him we would be here, but he is celebrating with his classmates. Aizawa then turned to Irai, gently tapping her back. Now go have fun. And so the small girl took some careful but steady steps towards the small crowd greeting everyone as she passed by them. As she walked around, Midoriya noticed something on her face. The horn in her forehead grew a bit. It looked more pointy now. Aizawa probably saw his gaze because as Midoriya turned around again, the teacher was practically waiting for the question to come. Her horn grew again, right? Yes, Aizawa answered tiredly. She's much more optimistic now. What you said to her before, about you all being there to help, she took your words very seriously. I see, the green-haired teen said, smiling as he watched Iri interacting with everyone, still in her shy ways but breaking out of the shell bit by bit. Oh, what is this that I see? A party with a mild mood? After the cultural festival, I thought the great class 1-0 would be an expert in O. 
Psy, come on, Monoma, it's Christmas Eve, give me a break. The door opened again and another small crowd quickly came in to escape from the cold outside. The guests for tonight's party, Class 1B. Of course, Monoma would somehow find a way to turn this into a competition, but he was cut short by the class rep, Kendo. Ah, you guys arrived just in time, Kaminari said, getting up to greet them along with Siro and Hagakure. Everyone got quickly into the mood, eating and chatting happily. Kirishima and Tetsutetsu already got into sumo wrestling, with Rin, Kamakiri, Kaibara, Ojiro, Bondo and Shoji behind in the line. Kuruwaro and Takoyami quickly engaged in a talk with some obscure references going around. Yayurazu and Kendo started a duel of shogi, with Takage, Shiozaki, Awase, Shoda, Honkuni, Ida, and Todoroki as spectators. Sato and Shishida were hosting their food-eating mini-contest, in which Bakugo swore to absolutely murder Monoma. Kaminari, Siro, Tsuburaba, and Mainta were in a more hidden side, sharing their collections of ahum beauties. The purple midget quickly had to be removed for being too explicit. Aoyama and Fukudashi were in another corner, speaking of who knows what fabulous and stylish topic. Kodai and Yanagi were busy playing with some of the pets Koda was showing off. And last but not least, Ashido, Hagakure, Tsunatori, Komori, Jiro, and Suyu were all playing with Iri, who was also very interested in the sweets at the center table. And aside from the heartwarming scene, Midoriya stood for a moment. His eyes wandered a little to the side, finding a certain someone far from everyone else, idly twirling a hair strand around her finger. Toga Himiko. He had to admit, seeing her in this state of tranquility was something not only rare but also enjoyable. Perhaps because she wasn't getting on anyone's nerves. Regardless, the green-haired teen felt that something was off with the current situation. His friends were all having a good time, and she was standing there, apparently neutral to the noise in the room. Coming to think of it, it was odd of Himiko to be this calm. She didn't think even once before annoying whoever was in her reach. Plus, the blondie had an awful habit of inserting herself in any random talk or activity in which she wasn't called for, her definition of getting acquainted with everyone. Yet, on tonight's Christmas Eve, she wasn't bothering anyone. Not that Midoriya was complaining, but it made him feel weird deep down. He didn't know for how long he stared at her, but the blondie slowly turned her head away from the window she was looking through and met his gaze. While Midoriya tensed a bit, imagining how to deal with her antics this time, Himiko simply smiled softly and waved at him, surprising the green-haired teen. Something was off with her, but that could wait. Midoriya heard his friends call him, and he quickly joined them into the party, but not before giving a last glance at the blonde girl leaning on the wall. The hours went by like a swift breeze as they enjoyed this moment, relaxing the max they could because what awaited them was only hard work. And now, for the main event of the night, the gift exchange. When they were planning the party, everyone from both classes got the name of someone else, and this was the person they would give their gift. The colorful boxes with cute ribbons and other shapes wrapped in paper laid on an impressive pile. Some gifts had an interesting shape when compared to others. Some were smaller, others had to be held with both hands. And to make things funnier, each person had to describe the person they got on the lottery until the others guessed who it was. And the first person to go was none other than Eri, encouraged by Yuraraka, Tsuyu, and Yayarazu. The silver-haired girl jumped from her seat at the couch, strategically close to the sweets at the table, and went to the pile where she looked for her gift. Picking up a small box wrapped in red wrapping with white bunny stamps, Iri shyly stood in the middle of the room. Um, she looked at Midoriya as if asking for confirmation, and he nodded with a smile, mouthing a go on to her. Breathing out slowly, Iri spoke again. The person I got is, kinda loud. This person looks a little mean, but is a good person and, he goes, boom, she said, moving her arms to emphasize her words. No more words were needed. It's back you go, both classes shouted in unison. Ha, huh? exclaimed the explosive teen, a little dumbfounded that it was the small girl from all people that got his name. Well, it wasn't a bad thing, but now he had to. 
Wow, this is so adorable, Komori said, cooing at the sight of Iri, the gift in hands, and looking at Bakugo with expectant eyes. Come on, Baku bro, don't leave Iri-chan waiting, said Kirishima. Shut up, I know that! Damn it! Bakugo hastily got up and walked to the center to receive the gift. He stood tall in front of the small girl, looking down at her cute big eyes. Happy birthday, she said, lifting the box to him and mustering a wavy smile, something she was training a lot too. The foo? No, you're supposed to say Merry Christmas. He picked the box from her hand, containing his natural aggressiveness the best he could. The cooing from those extras wasn't helping much though. What are you looking at? He was about to sit again when Kaminari intervened. Hey, Bakugo, open it, man. Yeah, we want to see what you got, Siro joined in. I won't open it just so you can see, shitty spark plug. However, Bakugo felt a tug at the hem of his shirt. He didn't want to look down because he knew what it was. Iri once again held expectant eyes towards our explosive boy, and as much as he hated to admit it, Bakugo couldn't say no to that. Not after all she had been through. Oh, for sake okay, I'll freaking open it. He shouted, but undid the ribbon on the box with care. Tearing the wrap and opening the box, Bakugo produced a quite curious object from it. It's an egg, both classes said in unison. Um, Iri chan you see, those are meant for Easter, boom. Before Siro could finish the sentence, Bakugo did a weak explosion, his glare telling the tape boy to shut up. Oi, Bakugo, aren't you forgetting to say something? Takage said, liking to tease someone that wasn't from her class. TCH, thanks, kid, his face even softened as Iri smiled back at him, but the smug looks of his classmates quickly reverted Bakugo to his usual angry self. What are you smiling at, you? And so the gift exchange went forward. Even Bakugo got into the game, a little forced, but he played along nonetheless. The funniest part was trying to guess who was the person receiving the gift, with some clever hints like the holiness in person, walking glamour and fashion, a normal but nice person, cool as ice, and a living robot. By a stroke of fate, Kirishima and Tetsutetsu picked each other, and what a surprise, both got karate gloves from each other. The gifts were also something else, ranging from a cute shirt Hagakure got from Rin to a giant prop sword Iri got from Takoyami, and Koda giving Shishida a special brush for thick fur. Since no one decided on a max value to spend on the gifts, you had cases like Yuraka giving Yanagi a small book about cosmic horror, and Gyro getting a top-tier, clearly expensive, pair of headsets from Todoroki. And of course, Yeyurazu wouldn't fall behind in that matter. She held a box that fit in her hand as she stood in the center of the common room. Well, the person I picked is very smart and dedicated, she started. It didn't narrow the options that much. This person is also very brave and wants to help others at any cost again, not very specific. They were all training to be heroes. But this person tends to cry sometimes. Oh shit, it's Midoriya, Kaminari, Siro, Owase, and Kaibara said together. Ha 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 ha, did you hear that, Deku? Your definition is being a crybaby. Ha, Bakugo laughed out loud. I don't cry like this as often, the green-haired teen said, slowly getting up to pick his gift because there was a little bit of truth to it. Yayurazu handed him the small box with an apologetic look on her face. The words she would normally use to describe him were, well, restricted by their current situation. Regardless, Midoriya accepted it with a sincere smile. Open it up, Midoriya. Yeah, we want to see the luxurious gift Yamomo brought, said Hagaruk and Ashido. You girls, just because I'm from a rich family doesn't mean I spend a lot of money, you know? The raven-haired girl defended herself. I'm joking, I'm joking, but seriously, the tea you make is always so delicious. It does make you feel like royalty, Ribbit, added the frog girl. Seeing as everyone was curious, Midoriya didn't see why not. Everyone was doing that anyway, so he might as well do the same. Careful to not destroy the wrapping completely, Midoriya opened the small red box and looked inside, while Yayarazu watched with expectant eyes. Then his eyes went wide like dishes, stars twinkling in his gaze. Oh my, oh my, goodness! 
and then he produced a small transparent packet from the box with a card inside. It's the shiny version of All Might's card from the All-Stars Heroes card game, he exclaimed in excitement, looking closely at the card, holding it like a fragile crystal glass. His classmates laughed lightly at the overreacting of All Might's number one fan. But then, he looked up at Yayarazu with a shocked face. Wait a minute, this was a limited edition that you could only get by buying the Silver Age All Might action figure during a very narrow time window. I didn't have the money at the time so I only got the figure later, how did you get it? Oh, it wasn't that hard. My mother knows someone that used to work at the company that released the cards Yayarazu answered as if it was the most common thing in the world. Midoriya had to suppress the tears pooling at the corners of his eyes. Thanks, Yayarazu-san, sniff my collection is finally. Yayarazu leaned forward a little and spoke in a lower voice. Look at what is underneath. Midoriya looked at the box again and lifted the red velvet cushion from the bottom of the box and what he found was as surprising as the rare card. It was a small red leather belt with a golden round plaque on it. With a quick look, he read the words, Good Boy, engraved on it. He glanced at Yeyarazu, who held the most innocent of the smiles. Flipping the golden tag, he found more engravings, Bad Boy. And finally, he noticed a tiny note written at the bottom of the box, For my naughty good boy Zoxo. So, did you like it? She asked with a gentle smile. Why, yeah, very much. I see I hope you and him enjoy it. She was planning something for tonight, wasn't she? Well, he kinda expected something to happen anyway. The exchange went on smoothly. Everyone was having a good fun time until Ashido noticed one of the few gifts remaining. She knew what it was, being the one who bought it. The problem was the person on the receiving end of it. And what a convenience Ojiro and Komori picked each other, giving space for someone else to go next. Deciding to get over with this quickly, she got up from the couch with a heavy sigh, picked up her gift, and got into the center. The person I got is, Ugh, I can't believe I'm doing this, she whispered annoyed. The person I got is, different. This person arrived without anyone asking, and makes sure that everyone is aware of her presence, which drives me nuts. She whispered the last part, but both classes knew exactly the feeling, especially the girls. There was a moment of silence in the room. No one felt like mentioning the name, and Ashido was making an effort to avoid as many offenses as possible while describing the annoying blondie. Speaking of which, Himiko remained all this time in her corner, sitting by the window and watching the night sky. It was only when she felt a ball of paper hit her head that she turned to the group reunited. Looking at both hero classes with a confused look, as all the eyes were focused on her, Himiko tilted her head. Eh? What? Ashido sighed tiredly again and showed the box in her hands. No, for me? Really? asked the blondie, surprise written on her face. Yes, someone said that everyone feels a little lonely sometimes, even you, I suppose. It stung her pride a little to say that, but Ashido made an extra effort. As for the blondie, Himiko remained in her place like a statue with a dumbfounded face. Ashido felt her eye twitch. See, come on, this is for you. You bought a gift for me, Pinky-chan, Himiko said, slowly making her way to the center of the room. Yeah, yeah, no big deal. Now come pick this quickly, she said, closing the distance between them with hasty steps and shoving the box into the blondie's arms, only for it to be slightly pushed back. But I didn't buy anything for you, no one told me about it. Not that I can leave this place anyway, but... It's fine, Momo-chan got me covered on the second gift. Her patience was already running thin. She pushed the box forward again. But I would feel bad if I didn't give you something, Himiko pushed the box again. Don't worry that little head of yours, okay? Ashido forced a smile to appear, although a little shaky. You didn't need to, Pinky-chan. I know, right? But take it anyway. I absolutely cannot, ha ha ha. Oh, but I insist. But I think I should at least. Just take the gift, woman, Ashido shouted. Looking at Himiko's face, it became clear to her that this back and forth was done on purpose. As usual, the blondie was playing with her. She sighed once again. Oh, do you mind if I open now, Pinky-chan? 
Go on, be my guest, Ashido answered, rolling her eyes as Himiko carefully undid the ribbon and tried to undo the wrapping paper without tearing it. I don't know what you like or not so I worked with what I know. Ashido said, pondering whether or not it was okay to take the gift back. I can't wait to see it then. If it was Pinky Chan who chose then it must be Gasp. As Himiko opened the box and looked inside, her eyes widened in surprise. What she produced from it was a cardigan, similar in color and size to the one she used to have. Oh my gosh, this is so sweet. Thank you, Pinky Chan, she exclaimed, jumping in place with her hands up, which surprised everyone watching the scene unfolding. It was almost as if she wasn't a complete psycho and a murderer. Again, don't mention it, I only did that because Midori thought it would be, ugh. Is that so? Thank you anyway, Pinky Chan. This will be my new treasure. Whatever, just don't get used to it, wa. Refusing to look directly at the bouncing girl, Ashido didn't see the bear hug coming from the blondie, neither the kiss on her cheek. She went stiff like a board as Himiko lifted her a bit from the ground and twirled around. Thank you so, so much, Mina-chan. I don't have anything for you, so please take this hug, okay? Bell let go of me. How many loose screws do you have? Ashido pushed the blondie away and broke free from Himiko's hold. Huh, the inhibitor collar would have been triggered if Himiko tried something funny. So, was that a legitimate hug? Even with that awkward moment, the gift exchange finished just fine. Midnight came, making it officially Christmas, and so the two classes cheered with their cans of soda in hand and wishing well to each other. Just a minute, guys, I have to make a call, Midoriya got up and quickly excused himself, grabbing a coat and stepping outside. With the phone in hand, he tapped one of his contacts. Oh, hi there, Izuku, Merry Christmas, sounded the voice from the other end. Merry Christmas, May. Sorry I couldn't make it to the party with you guys, but my class insisted on having everyone together. It's fine, you should hang with your friends too. Yeah yeah I know. They did mention I had been spending too much time with you guys from the hero course. Something about hogging the clientele ha ha ha. Well at least to me, I know where to go when needing support gear. Oh, and you care to share your supplier? I might offer a partnership Hatsum said playfully. I think you know her. She's the most beautiful in the entire support course. Aw, you flatter me. Makes me consider giving a good discount. They laughed lightly. Anyway, I wish you were here too. It doesn't feel quite right without you, you and Nimuri around. Don't worry, babe. You won't have to cope with the lack of my stunning presence for long. Is that so? Then I'll be waiting. They said bye and hung up the call. Then, Midoriya felt a very known sensation sneak up in his back. A ghost touch that didn't come from outside, the exact opposite. It was faint, almost imperceptible if he got distracted. But if he focused enough, the phantom touch would turn into a warm feeling of something soft pressing against him. Then, his mind registered a pair of imaginary arms wrapping around his body. A faint noise echoed inside his head, the sound of clear bells that carried a light laugh with it. I see Hatsum is getting more confident in her looks, said the former user of One for All and Mentor of All Might. Merry Christmas to you, Nana-san. Thanks to you too. Say you didn't prepare anything for me, did you? Asked the ghost within One for All and his mind. Well, I couldn't buy everyone a present, but with you I can at least make this, and so Midoriya made a mental image of a small box wrapped in gift wrap and with a red ribbon on top of it. Opening it, Nana found a round silver locket. And inside the locket was a picture, which was the most surprising part. Toshinori in his buff form, flexing his arms up, along with herself and Izuku, somehow mimicking his pose. They all had their hero costumes and big smiles crossing their faces. This was but a construction inside Midoriya's head, she knew it, but that meant so much to her that Nana struggled to believe it was anything less than real. Well, considering her very state of being, it was a reality to her. Aw, oh, you shouldn't have bothered, Nana joked as she traced the edges of the locket with a finger, touched with the gesture. I feel like I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you, Nana-san. Not only for the time you helped me when I got unconscious, but also for everything else. 
You helped me see some things about me that I wasn't aware of, and I'm very grateful to have you in my head. Nana remained silent for a moment, but he could feel a faint sense of agitation somewhere inside his mind. Oh Izuku, aren't you the sweetest guy in the world? said the former user of One for All, and Midoriya felt a brisk sensation in his cheek. Trying to get rid of the flush that certainly got to his face, Midoriya shook his head and headed inside again. However, as he opened the door, he found a pair of yellow cat eyes. Hemiko, he jumped back, looking at the grinning blonde with wide eyes and in a defensive stance. I was wondering when you would come in again. What are you doing here? He lowered his arms but kept with a frown on his face. The night was so good until now. Well, I can't get through this door without getting permission, remember? Himiko said, pointing at the white ring around her neck. For her to leave, it had to be either class time or with the voice command of someone. And what would you do out here anyway? Midoriya asked with a skeptical tone. Nothing, just chill with you. Crossing his arms, Midoriya looked at her with a face that said, Really? Come on, Izuku, it won't hurt to be at least a little bit amicable with me. Say it for yourself. Sai, can't I at least step out? I want some fresh air. He seriously considered whether or not denying her wishes would be of any use, but in the end, Himiko would keep being herself and insist on getting closer to him. Whatever, command Midoriya Izuku would disable perimeter limit. He voiced the commands and the collar blinked with a blip. Himiko took a tempting step outside as if she didn't fully believe it was safe to do so. Of course, this was an act. Jumping in place and clapping her hands like a small kid, she giggled and took a deep breath in, releasing slowly and looking up at the night sky. Thanks, Izuku. Don't mention it, he answered coldly. Since she was here now, Midoriya decided to keep an eye on her. It wasn't as if Himiko could escape from Yue, or something, but he felt that she might cause trouble for someone else if she had the opportunity. So they remained in silence for a while, Himiko enjoying the view and Midoriya facing the exact opposite direction of her. So, Izuku. What now? Where is my gift? Your what? He turned to her with a mix of confusion and curiosity on his face. My Christmas gift. From you, I mean, she said, twirling in place to show off the cardigan she just received. Mina-chan gave me this, but it was you who decided that I should be included, right? She asked with a smile crossing her lips. Um, well yes, but what does it have to do with me giving you a gift? Oh, I imagine that you said that to your friends because you wanted to give me something. Ha, huh, only in your head, that's for sure. Oh well, a girl can dream. So, can I ask you to give me something else instead? It doesn't even need to be a physical thing. Please, 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 Himiko said, jumping closer to Midoriya and putting her hands together above her head as she bowed down. What? No, I, considering the scene Himiko pulled with Ashido earlier, Midoriya felt that this would take a while if he kept refusing, and right now he didn't want to deal with her because it was always a mental and sometimes physical drain to his energies. Pinching the bridge of his nose, he sighed, already feeling tired. Okay? But it better not be something stupid. Perking up, Himiko smiled at him and cheered, tossing her arms up. Then, looking around quickly, she leaned forward to whisper her wish to him. Can you have me really good, Izuku? Midoriya scowled. What did I just say about being stupid? Okay, okay, sheesh. Hmm, how about you praise me for my good behavior lately? I wouldn't classify it as good behavior. You're not making this very easy, Izuku, dear, she whined. Then let's forget about it. No, 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 wait. Um, Himiko put a finger in her lips as she pondered, squinting her eyes close and humming. Then she piped up and her eyes shone with excitement. Oh, I know. Midoriya looked at her with a mildly unamused face. Normally, he would be on the edge around her or act as mean as possible to counter her attempts at getting closer to him. But right now Midoriya couldn't feel less interested in whatever this crazy blonde had in mind. So much that he had a huge delay reacting to her closing the gap between them. Her yellow eyes seemed to glow in the night as she stared right into his green ones. 
Can you give me a hug, Izuku? She asked softly. Her voice lacked the usual cheerful tone. Along with the request itself, this caught Midoriya pretty off guard. A hug? Yeah. It would be nice if it came from you, but I'm sticking with just hugging you if you don't feel like touching me. He took a moment to process that. That's it? Just a hug? I mean, I have a long, long list of things I want to do with you and for you to do with me, she said with a smug face. But I should know better than try and force you into doing them. Well, ain't that rich coming from you now? As he said that, Midoriya felt the anger towards the blonde inside him flare up. The nerve of this girl. I know, I know, that's still asking a lot. But come on, just a hug. I won't bite. Unless you want me to, Himiko laughed, but once she saw Midoriya not doing the same, she shut her mouth. Putting her best puppy eyes and opening her arms, she pleaded for his permission with a look. Midoriya breathed in and released yet another tired sigh. He might as well get over with this and go back inside to have fun with his friends. Lifting his arms slightly, he looked at her with a bored face. Do it. Kamiko laughed lightly. I knew you wouldn't resist my charms for long. Don't force it. Hi. And in a split second, Himiko closed the gap between them, rolling her arms around Midoriya's torso like snakes and practically gluing her body against his. He was reminded that Himiko was fairly stronger than she appeared to be, but it wasn't a crushing hug. No, it was just tight, long, warm even. The crazy blondie nuzzled against his chest and under his chin, all while the emerald child stood still, surprised with the act as a whole. Ha, you're so warm, Izuku. Ni, Izuku, can I ask you something else? If it is sec you can. No, no, not yet, she said, looking up at him, her arms loosening around him and sliding down, but still keeping him within her reach. Can I? I was wondering if, if you wouldn't. She hesitated, and for some reason, this annoyed him more than her usual self. Spit it out, Himiko, I don't have all night. Can I have your blood? His eyes widened in shock, and he immediately took a step back, dragging her along as she kept her arms around his waist. I knew it, you were just waiting to. Izuku, listen, I just... No. Just, just listen for once, okay? And then they stopped. Something in the way she asked no begged for him to stop and listen to what she had to say made the green-haired teen cease his attempt to break free, and Himiko didn't move any further either. Once again she looked right into his eyes. Taking a deep breath, Himiko tried to explain herself. I know it is hard for you to understand. You're a normal person after all. I like blood, you know that damn well, and it's been so long since I had a chance to taste it. But that's not the reason why I want it now. Despite his better judgment, Midoriya dared to let this go further. And, what is the reason then? You, she answered without skipping a beat, I would never forget the taste of your sweet, sweet blood, Izuku. It is special to me, but because it is you. You still don't get it, do you? I hate. Me, yeah, I heard loud and clear all the times you told me that, but I don't care, I still love you. Midoriya was baffled. Not only Himiko looked a lot more like a normal high school girl, even while talking so passionately about blood, but he also didn't feel on the edge with her being so close to him. It's just a little, it won't hurt much. All I want for this Christmas is a little drop of your sweet, precious blood. She asked again, looking straight into his green eyes. As for Midoriya, confusion was the definition of his current state of mind and here he thought Himiko couldn't go any crazier. Who asks to suck someone else's blood? This was the reminder that Himiko wasn't normal. She wasn't nice, she was a menace in the disguise of a girl, and he knew that better than anyone. Considering the living hell she forced him to go through, she might as well walk hand in hand with the devil, as far as he was concerned. So he questioned himself, why was he feeling divided? Midoriya was torn apart. His mind screamed at him to shove her aside, punch her if needed, and get as far as possible from Himiko. But deep in his heart, he felt that under all that psychosis and pesky stubbornness, there could be something remaining to save. Would she put up that huge act all this time just to make his life miserable? 
Heimko was more fond of physical pain that he knew for sure. What was the point in all this, he didn't know anymore. Rather, it changed somewhere along the way as he started to see the blondie under a different light. Another question took over his mind now. Was Midoriya willing enough to dig deeper and see if he could find in Himiko anything worth saving? Was it even possible to save a villain? Well, he didn't think so, but what if she wasn't one? Sigh, it was worth the shot, I guess, Himiko said, looking away from Midoriya. Gazing up at the stars one more time, she turned to him again and gave another warm hug, trying to feel as much of his body as possible, burning the sensation in her memory. I'll leave you now, Izuku. I know resisting my charms for so long can be tiring so. Why? Her joke was cut by a simple, vague question. Huh? Why? Why me? Why do this? Have all this trouble? Do you really think there could be something, anything between us? He questioned her. Her hands were halfway on letting go, but Himiko slowly hugged his waist again. You don't. They started at each other as the air felt heavier. Oh, Izuku, I thought we had discussed that before. Are you going to tell me that after all this time, all the loops I jumped through to prove my feelings for you, you didn't consider it even once? He was not going to admit that in front of her, but his face was enough of an answer. Keep in mind, Izuku, that you're more than worth the trouble. She kept staring at his face, but Midoriya looked elsewhere. It was simply too mentally draining to deal with her sometimes. This time, however, something felt different. So, in the spirit of the holiday, or maybe because he simply wanted to bring it all to an end, Midoriya sighed tiredly. He didn't make a decision, but for now, it fell into the category of why not. I'm going to regret this, ain't I? He said, with a tone of defeat in his voice. Hamiko quirked one eyebrow in curiousness. Then, the green-haired teen slowly reached for the collar of his jacket, pulling down the layers of clothes beneath it. Just sigh get done with it quickly, he said, reluctantly exposing his neck. Himiko widened her eyes in surprise and she squealed in joy. You mean it, Izuku? For real? Yeah, yeah, whatever. Oh my, oh my, oh, that's so nice of you. I knew you had a soft spot for Lilmi. I might change my mind, he said dryly. Okay, okay, breathe in, sigh. Oh, right, the collar. It will trigger if I bite you. Apparently, love bites are not a thing in the system, she said, rolling her eyes. Midoriya pinched the bridge of his nose. Command, Midoriya Izuku, disable close combat restrictions. The white ring bleeped, signaling it got reconfigured. Then, Himiko slowly approached Midoriya, her eyes fixed at the fair skin exposed to the cold air of winter. The moon shone brightly despite being in a half-phase, which gave a faint silver glow to his eyes. The blondie carefully rested her hands on his shoulders, inching closer and closer at an awfully slow pace, at least to him. She supposed anything beyond that would scare the green teen, despite his tough act towards her. Himiko felt his sweet scent of cinnamon and mint, a sensation she didn't feel in a long time. Meanwhile, Midoriya tried to get a hold of all his muscles at once. As the blondie got closer to her target, Midoriya felt her hot breath brush briskly against his skin, and the danger alarms inside his head went off like crazy. It took him a lot of concentration to not flash back into the room. It was past him to feel like this, it had to be by now, otherwise, he simply failed into getting over this fear. And then, the contact. Midoriya flinched slightly despite his efforts to turn into a statue, but the surprise quickly got followed by confusion and curiosity. He expected to feel a piercing sensation, but all he got was a warm and slightly wet touch on his skin. This was definitely not what he expected to happen, neither what came next. Stiff as you are, Izuku, I'll end hurting you. So please relax, okay? she said calmly, passing to give small licks on his neck and suck on it, leaving faint hiccups here and there. Liking it or not, Midoriya slowly felt his muscles get less tense and he somehow got his mind to step down from overdrive more. He even moved his head to the side unconsciously, making it easier for Himiko to access his exposed neck. She took a moment to back off a little and admire the faint marks that remained on his neck, remembering their first date with fondness. 
Then, with surgical precision, she opened her mouth and her white fangs brushed against his skin, finding the exact spot where she used to bite before. Midoriya felt a chill run down his spine as her hot breath brushed against his neck, and so, the piercing sensation. Being locked with Himiko and Himiko only for so long, Midoriya ended noticing the smallest details as the time passed. For example, she didn't go full vampires, rupturing arteries or veins. Anyway, Midoriya shook these thoughts away. He got so stunned by this whole situation that he forgot to pull her away. It was meant to be a small treat, not a whole meal. Grabbing her strongly by the arms, Izuku pushed Himiko away, but she moved her hands behind his head and neck, managing to keep them still very close. That's enough for you, he said with an assertive tone. I know, just let me. Himiko leaned forwards and gave a long lick up his neck, also taking the opportunity to leave a quick peck on his cheek, which made Midoriya flinch back and push her away at once. The blonde giggled. There, I cleaned it for you. Humph, are you done already? he said, fixing his clothes and placing one hand over the bitten area. Yes, I'm done and satisfied, see? It wasn't that bad, now was it? Ah yes, that smug look she held right now. It ignited the anger inside him and made Midoriya want to Detroit smash her face. Just at 0.5%. But Himiko had other plans as she stepped back while staring at him, her smile never wavering. Well, I'll leave you to have fun with everyone now. You should reactivate the restrictions, she said, stepping back into the dorms, but remaining at the doorway. Ha ah, yes, command Midoriya Izuku, enable perimeter limit and close combat restrictions, the white ring bleeped again as the configurations were reset. Well, thanks for the gift, Izuku. It meant a lot, Himiko said, retreating inside the dorms in silence and disappearing to her room, unnoticed by the other classmates inside. As for Midoriya, he waited a bit more outside. He didn't want to explain any hiccups. However, there was another reason for him waiting outside. Looking at the stars, along with his thoughts, and Nana, Midoriya wondered where this would go from now on. This situation with Himiko made an unexpected turn, and him wondering if she could be a good person wasn't a good sign. Probably. He would leave the deep thinking for later on, as suggested by Nana. He still had a party to enjoy and friends to have fun with. So, for how long do I have to keep the blindfold again? The green-haired teen asked. Until we're ready, cutie. You can't rush these things, you know, said the invisible girl as she and the others got busy with who knows what. It would be easier if you told me what these things are. It's called a surprise for a reason, Izu, Satsuna said. I'm still not sure if this is an okay thing to do, Ibarra spoke. Relax, girls, it will be fun. Pony even went the extra mile to fix it all for us, Nimuri said. You, um... I didn't have the materials for everyone so I had to improvise and adapt some parts. It should be fine since it is your clothes anyway, said the short blondie, with a hint of nervousness in her voice. I'm sure it will be perfect, Pony Itsuka assured her friend. You can drop by the development studio anytime you want to check and see if there is something useful, May told the short girl. Oh, really? Thanks. Not gonna lie, the competition seems a bit unfair, Riaiko commented. Sigh, no need to remind me of that, Kayoka also complained. Well, it's not my fault some of us have obscenely huge tits. Can you at least not look at me while saying this, Ochako? The pink-haired inventor said, clearly annoyed. What? It's just the truth, replied the brunette. I thought huge bosoms were always a good thing. And you're not that modest either, Ochako Yui said in her flat, cold tone. The last comment made the brunette mumble something since now she was under the gaze of Kayoka, Riaiko, Komori, and Suyu. Come on girls, you know I'm joking. Well, jokes or not, our precious boy loves bosoms of all shapes and sizes, right sweetie? You said, hugging Izuku still blindfolded and nuzzling on his chest. You make it sound like I'm the ultimate pervert said the emerald child. Ah, don't feel like that, Izuku. We all know you love us regardless of our looks, Momo said, caressing his head gently. Then she leaned and whispered in his ears. But my good boy loves his masters the most, don't you? 
Oi, I heard that, you said, pulling Izuku closer in her embrace. Of course he prefers mine, right, sweetie? Huh, well, as long as my love likes my chest size, I'm happy with it, Kanoko said, and there was a brief moment of silence before the girls co-ed at the short brunette. Aw, oh, can you be sweeter? Nimuri said, rubbing Kanoko's head, much to the brunette's embarrassment. But that's enough chit-chat, pony dear if you will. Hi. Izuku felt you let go of him and a pair of hands held his own. He followed who he assumed was Pony, then turned around as she guided him. Um, girls, before we go any further, I have to say, I wanted to give you all something, but I couldn't find the time to buy anything specific, and I'm not sure I had all that money on me, to begin with, so... It's okay, Deku-kun. You don't have an obligation to give us all gifts Ochako cut his mumbling spree right at the beginning. But I... If you want to give us all a gift, there's something you can do, ribbit ribbit. Okay, Izu-kun, you can take the blind now, Pony said, and so he did. Once he opened his eyes, Izuku found quite the sight to see. Teacha, teach and Merry Christmas, the girls said in unison. Meanwhile, the teen took a long moment to appreciate what was in front of him. The girls he loved and cared for so much, all dressed in skimpy outfits themed after Christmas. For example, most of them were wearing a red tube dress with white fluffy strips at the hem and top part of it. The length barely went below the waist. The variant was a combination of a top and skirt, both covering the bare minimum, which was the case for Mina, Sitsuna, Yui, Achako, and Yu. Another fine detail he noticed, Momo and Nimuri were using thin black stocking, adding to the outfits. But perhaps the most curious cases were Ibarra and Pony. The vine girl used some plain white robes loosely tied around her figure, a golden halo above her head, and a pair of wings in her back. As for the short foreign girl, a brown top and shorts, both covering the bare minimum, and the tip of her nose was painted red. So, like what you see, honey? Nimuri asked seductively, breaking the green teen out of his entranced state. Eh? Ah, yes, uh, this was the surprise. Wow, I don't even know what to say. You all look so, wow, he fumbled with his words. It didn't matter that he had seen them naked many times before, he always found them as stunning as the first time he fell in love with them. And the girls giggled at his loss of words. Did you make all of these, pony? He asked the short blondie. Well, I asked everyone if they would agree on making a little cosplay with me, and they said yes so. L, like I said, I had to adapt here and there. Did you like it? Pony said, shifting nervously in her place. Ah, she's bonding with everyone already. Keep an eye open, Izuku, you might get more surprises like this from now on, echoed Nana's voice inside his head. Yeah, I'm glad Pony is adjusting well. Also, it kinda makes me happy to see them together like this. Nechimim, you and your little friend, am I right? Only now that Nana pointed out, Izuku realized his pants were feeling quite tight. To the girls, however, it didn't go unnoticed as they were already circling him. My my Izuku, if I knew you'd get that happy just by seeing us, I would have tried cosplay way earlier, said the R-rated hero as her hands traveled down his body and gently groped the bulge under his pants. I, I just like to see you all are getting along so well, ah. Uh. A faint moan escaped his lips as one by one, the girls started to feel his body, stimulating it in some way or another. Oh, Deku-kun, that's so sweet of you, but this is only the first part of the surprise, she said and laughed lightly, but he could already sense the lust dripping from her voice. While being undressed, Izuku was practically carried to the large bed in the middle of the room. Looking up, he found all the eyes focused on his almost naked figure. They gleamed with desire, and the girls could barely contain themselves behind the sweet, innocent smiles they held. To think that the one thing preventing them from going all out against each other was Izuku himself. Ooh, can I ask why Ibarra has wings? He pointed at the vine girl. She's the angel that goes on top of the tree, right, Ibarra? Sitsuna said, earning a yelp from Ibarra as she slapped the girl's butt. I still think a real angel would use more, modest clothing, Ibarra said, adjusting the loose white robes to cover her shoulders a bit more. Don't give me that, we all know you're a naughty, curious angel. 
and I'll guess you're the red-nosed reindeer, he turned to Pony again, and she replied with a happy nod. All right, before we get to the fun part, hop. Mimuri pulled Izuku up and made him sit on her lap, hugging him from behind. This Santa mommy came to give you a lot of gifts, but only if you were a good boy this year. Have you been a good boy, Izuku? Or have you been a naughty, naughty boy, huh? She said, whispering the last part in his ears and sending chills down his spine. Oh, he has been a good boy all right, haven't you, Izuku? Momo said, opening the small box she gave to him as her gift. Izuku thought she might want him to use it right away so he brought it with him. The raven-haired girl gently put the red collar around his neck, making it as tight as possible without choking him or making it uncomfortable. She took a moment to admire the golden round tag, tracing it with her index finger. And then it all started. Really, what a shame I have a thing for naughty boys. But we can work something to you too, Nimiri said. This is where the fun part starts. Boom. The door of the love nest forcefully came down to the floor, which was telling a lot since it was meant to slide open and close. Everyone looked in shock in that direction, startled by the loud noise and all the smoke. Normally, May's inventions would fail spectacularly like this, but she revised the systems more than once, and she was on a streak of days without disasters. So what could have caused such a violent event? As the smoke cleared, the answer appeared. They all wished it didn't, though. Let's go back in time a couple of minutes, about half an hour. It is past midnight, and the party is coming to its end. The guys from 1B were back at their dorms, and in the common room, a few students from 1A remained. Hey you all, don't go to sleep too late just because you are on a short break, said Aizawa as he came inside, crossing the room and looking around. Where is Iri? he asked the four boys on the couch. Oh, she fell asleep over there. We didn't want to wake her up, Kirishima pointed across the room where Iri slept peacefully in a large bean bag, using someone's jacket as a blanket, probably Shoji's, given the size and extra sleeves. Aizawa calmly walked to her and crouched down, giving a soft push to the girl. She stirred a bit and woke up, sitting up and rubbing her eyes. Time to go, she asked the scruffy teacher. Yeah, come on, I'll carry you, he said, offering a hand. Iri looked around, still half asleep. I wanted to say thanks to Yuraraka san and Susan and everyone else. Were they nice to you? Hi, everyone was really. Yawn nice to me. I don't see them around here. Here, jump up, putting Eri on his back, Aizawa returned to the guys sitting at the couch. I suppose everyone else already went to bed. I guess so, sensei. The girls headed up together and the rest went one after another, answered Siro. Even Deku? asked the silver-haired girl from her place in Aizawa's back. Midoriya left not long ago, Todoroki said. Oh. The small girl looked a little let down upon hearing this. Don't be so sad, Iri-chan. We still have a few days before the hero work studies, so we can all play together again. Right, Aizawa-sensei, Kaminari said with a bright smile, trying to cheer her up. Sure, you can thank everyone later on. There will be plenty of opportunities for you, Aizawa confirmed, instantly getting a more bright expression from Ari. He was well aware of her mental condition and backstory, and given that her power was somewhat tied to her emotional state, it was only natural to expose her to healthy interactions like this, at the right doses of course. He expected to see a gradual increase in progress with her quirk as Ari became more and more open to interacting with people. There was a lot of the world that she didn't know, and it was one of his jobs to show this kid that had lived in the dark what good the world had to offer. So, bye-bye, Kirishima-kun, Sparky-kun, Tape-kun, Isahat-kun, she waved at the boys as Aizawa headed outside, putting his coat over her so she wouldn't be directly exposed to the cold wind. She didn't get all of our names yet, ha-ha-ha, <laughs> Kaminari said, waving back at her. Not only that, but she also got some of the names Bakugo uses, Siro added. At least Bakugo doesn't curse as much with her around, Tadaroki commented in his flat tone. Man, she's attached to Midoriya, right? Kirishima said, stretching his arms up. He's pretty likable, and there's the fact he saved her. The three other teens looked at Todoroki. What? 
Ooh, nothing. Oh yeah, guys, check this out, Kaminari said, showing his wrist. You know how the trackers will warn if we get too distant from each other? Well, since they are down for maintenance, I thought of testing a few things with mine, and guess what I found. Bro, are you sure you can tweak those? said the red-haired boy with a concerned face. It's fine, I didn't tamper anything. So what did you find? asked the tape boy. I discovered it by accident, but the sensors work on radio waves, and if I use my quirk like this, Kaminari proceeded to take off his bracelet and place it near to his ear. His hand then shot tiny yellow sparks in arcs. I can hear them pinging each other. No way, so it's like a tracker, Kirishima asked, eyes wide with surprise and an exciting smile crossing his face. Yeah, wanna try, said the blondie, placing the bracelet close to Kirishima's ear. The hardening boy got even more excited as he heard a blip noise in the middle of the soft hum from the electrical current. Cool, you could use something like this as an item too. I was thinking the same, dude, so that's what it feels like to be a genius. Kaminari said, holding a smug grin. So you can track anyone using a bracelet, asked the half-hot, half-cold teen, looking interested at the ring in Kaminari's hand. Nah, only the bracelet's tied to my unit. The tracking system is down, but they still emit the signal, I guess. For example, Kirishima is right next to me, so that's one blip. There are two more close by. Oh, someone's coming closer. Kaminari looked around and spotted the ash blonde explosive teen getting out of the kitchen and heading upstairs. There, hey, back you go. Go off, spark plug, came the response, harsh as usual. Yo, Baku bro, we just found something cool about the bracelets. Check this out, Kirishima called him. Ha? Huh? Do I look like I want to waste time with this shit? Oh right, I forgot you sleep early, Siro said, looking at the time on his phone. It is almost like a baby, Todoroki added with his neutral face. What was that half and half? Bakugo exclaimed, stomping his way to the couch and snatching the bracelet from Kaminari's hands. What am I supposed to see? Not see here, Lemmy. Kaminari took the bracelet back and applied a weak current to his hand, making the sounds appear again. Cool, right? I can tell if you guys are close or not now. And why would I want to know if you extras are close by or not? Come on, don't be like that, Baku bro. TCH, what a waste of time. We know everyone is here anyway, Dunce face. Well, you and Kirishima are. That's why there are two very clear blips. The weaker one is Minta upstairs, Kaminari explained. Oh, can you try with other bracelets? Siro suggested, already taking his own off. Todoroki did the same, out of curiosity. Picking up both rings from his friends, Kaminari tested Todoroki's first. Let's see, who's on your unit again, Todoroki? Koda, Ojiro, and Aoyama. Yep, three blips, not so loud and clear because they are upstairs. And in your team, Siro? Midoriya Ashido Hagakure, and you know who. The tape boy said the last part with a hint of tiredness in his voice. Meet him in theirs. Wait, what? Kaminari looked at the ring, then put it close to his ear again, a look of shock taking place on his face. What's up, Kaminari? Kirishima asked. There's only one signal. It seems to be in the dorms, but, oh no. The guys exchanged worried glances as realization slowly hit them. Without even speaking, they quickly headed upstairs, getting to the last floor on the girl's side where she stayed. Kaminari banged at the door as soon as they reached it. Oi, Toga, get the hell over here. Nothing, not a single response. Oi, Toga, he bashed more at the door, making a lot of noise. Glancing back at the others, he was ready to turn the knob and try to barge in, but then the door swung open. I heard from the first time, geez, it's freaking midnight and oh, the blondie finally answered the door, wearing a large white shirt with an All Might stamp on it. Okay, interesting choice there. She rubbed her eyes, then noticed the small group staring at her. Hey guys, is the party still going? Don't play dumb, where are they? The electric teen asked, straight to the point. Where are they? What are you, ooh, don't tell me, someone is missing, and you think I'm the culprit, she had seen this scene before. 
We're not joking, Toga. Midoriya, Ashido, and Hagakure. Where are they? Toga looked at each of the faces staring at her with a skeptical look on her own. A devilish smile opened on her lips. How should I know? Did you even check their rooms before coming here? She teased them. Kaminari stepped forward. And no, actually I mean we know they are not here, but you are. So. So you assumed I was the one responsible. But how, my dear friend Sparky Kun, would I do that when I can't even leave my room after ten on normal days? I was out of the party when you were all together, she calmly said, making Kaminari take that step back. Listen here you, one step out of the line and I'll blast your head off your body, got it? Bakugo threatened her, with smoke coming out of his hands. Ua, scary, I don't know where they are. You could look for them though. The guys looked at each other for a moment. She wasn't wrong in anything she said so far. I would help too, but well, let's say it would be a shocking experience, Toga said, laughing lightly. If that's all boys, I'll go back to sleep. Thanks for coming by, and the door closed, without a lot of reactions from the small group. Just to make sure, they knocked on the doors of their missing friends, only to confirm that they were not there. Midoriya's room was even opened, and so was the glass door leading to the balcony. Should we look for them? proposed Todoroki. Why should I care about where the hell Deku is? It's not like that loser would go anywhere far from here. So that's your way of saying you're concerned. The hell was that? Before Bakugo could start a serious fight, Siro barged in. Look, the campus is big, he could be anywhere inside it, but still around. Why don't we go look for them? Well, I would need to get in the range first. Ah, uh, let's go. It's not like I have anything to do tomorrow. And so, the small group of teens went out to explore, fully covered with warm clothes and following the electric teen's lead as he tried to get in range for his improvised tracker to start working. TCH, typical Deku, getting away like this. Bakugo grumbled in the back of the group as they walked around the campus. Don't worry, I'm sure Midoriya is capable of handling a dangerous situation. Also, Ashido and Hagakure are... Ha! Who said I'm worried, Isahat? Oshhh, I'm trying to get a very faint signal. Plus, we might get in trouble if Aizawa or another teacher catches us, Kaminari complained. Don't shhh me, dunce face. Why do I have to be out here in the cold, Deku? You know, you didn't have to come too, Siro added quietly. Do you want my jacket, bro? I'm fine with one less layer Kirishima offered, ready to pull the zipper down. What do you take me for, ha? Huh? This wind is weak. I could lend you one of my jackets, too. The cold doesn't bother me much, anyway, Tadaroki said. Listen, hell with freeze before I have to get something from you extras. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Can I get some silence now? Kaminari complained again. Bakugo was about to shout about, don't tell me what to do but Kirishima managed to defuse the living bomb. As they progressed through the dark campus, only illuminated by the moonlight that occasionally shone through the clouds, the small group wandered from the Alliance Heights dorms to the central part of the school. The gyms were all the way across, so they would check the main buildings first. However, an unexpected meeting happened. Oh, what's this? The great class 1A is up and out of their dorms way past curfew time, is this type of rule-breaking behavior what we should expect from the great class O? None other than Manoma came across them, accompanied by a waist Tetsutetsu, and who they assumed to be Kirwaro since they could only see a pair of floating eyes and white teeth in the dark. A waist was the one to cut Manoma's obligatory speech since their class rep wasn't here. We're doing the same, you dumbass, said the boy with a head strip. Yo, what are you dudes doing here? Tetsutetsu asked them, stepping forward to fist bump Kirishima. We're looking out for some missing friends. And you? Kirishima asked back. What a coincidence, so are we, said the pitch black team. A waste here didn't see Shiozaki coming back and went to ask Kendo if she saw her. Turns out Kendo and Takage are missing too. Wait, couldn't you ask Shishida to find them? Siro asked them. Well, we kind of avoid asking him to do these things. He's not a detection dog, you know. Besides, he goes to sleep early. 
He hit the sack like a rock, Tetsu Tetsu added. Oh, so he's like Bakugo Todoroki also added. I'm not a kid. It's okay, bro, that's a healthy habit. So you're wandering around aimlessly too? Oase asked them while Kirishima prevented Bakugo from getting a hold of Todoroki's neck. Nah, we got this Kaminari showed the bracelet, but judging by the clueless face Oase had, he went to explain. You see, I can use my quirk to make the bracelets work as a tracking device, as long as it is in range and is part of your unit. Wow, that's cool, I didn't know it was possible. Me neither, I just recently discovered that, once again Kaminari showed off with a smug face. Oh really? Then allow me Monoma gave a slap not so gentle on the back of Kaminari's head and took off his bracelet, bringing the ring to his ears. Oh, nothing happened, he said, looking at Kaminari with a wise grin that pissed the electric team more than the slap. That must be because your unit is out of range. Ah, Oase and I are on the same team, Tetsutetsu said, tossing his ring to Kaminari. Yeah, one clear blip. Is Kendo or any of the other girls in your teams? asked Kaminari. Kendo is in my team, Monoma answered. Yeesh, too bad for her. Siro said, earning a laugh from the copycat blondie. Why don't you guys join us, Kirishima suggested. That would be quite helpful, said the black teen. Great, another batch of extras to drag around. And so the enlarged group kept exploring the school at night. It was quite the experience, honestly. An ambient familiar to them could look so different and mysterious just with a different lighting and way fewer people around along with the complete silence, aside from their occasional chats. Finding the guys from 1B at that moment also proved to be an advantage since they covered the main building of the school where they had classes. This cut some of the areas they had to go through. The next one would be the support course's main building. It was relatively separated from the rest since they had many special classes that required equipment and proper space. Despite that, they were somewhat familiar with the layout of the place, or at least Ciro was familiar with the path to the development studio. He came here a few times along with Ashido, Hagakure, and Midoriya to see the pink-haired mad inventor known as Hatsume. And finally, Kaminari got something on his tracker. SHHHH guys, I think I got something. What did I say about making SHHH to me? SHHHH, I got something too, but it's very faint. Monoma said. He had been helping Kaminari with the tracking. Needless to say, the explosive teen was about to make an impression of a landmine. What did you get there, Monoma? Hmm, weird. There are two faint blips. I got three on Ciro's bracelet. Wait, why is it weird? Well, the copying blonde pondered. A waste felt Shiozaki was missing, and we didn't find Kendo nor Takage, who we supposed would know where our class rep is. The thing is, Kendo and Kamori are on my team, and I know for sure Bondo is at the dorms. So, what's the big deal? Sai, why would Kamori be here? She's with Kendo. Well, that seems obvious. The real question is why. Well, we can ask when we find them. Can we keep going? Kirwaro said, and the two blondies in the lead resumed their tracking. It was a matter of finding the general direction and following it as the signal became stronger. They would eventually zero into the location. Ni Kaminari, now that I think of it, is Midoriya with Ashido and Hagakure too? Siro asked the blondie. Well, apparently yes. The signals have the same strength at all times. Huh. Do you think they went out together? Kirishima asked the tape boy. Ha, Deku, going out with a girl. Not in a million years, Bakugo said, laughing loudly. Why is that so? He's quite popular if you didn't notice recently, Todoroki questioned the cackling team. TCH, he's just a useless Deku. I don't know if these girls are blind or stupid, but there's no way that nerd would go out with a girl. Even less being alone with two. I think you underestimate his charming traits, Bakugo. You want to date the nerd, Isahat? because that made you sound hella gay. Todoroki looked at him with a plain face, looked ahead in contemplation for a while, and looked at Bakugo again. You really think so? The explosive teen slapped his forehead, mumbling something about being surrounded by idiots. 
Not gonna lie, Todoroki, sometimes you sound like you have a thing for Midoriya, Kaminari said from his place in the lead. I think it is okay to say nice things about your bros, Kirishima said. Yeah, totally. You gotta cheer your bros up sometimes Tetsutetsu joined his hardening friend and rival. I'm just concluding things. The girls from our class seem to be very close to him, Todoroki justified himself, despite not seeing the problem with thinking Midoriya had a charm. Yeah, I could say the same. At first, I thought it was only Kendo, with Midoriya being her boyfriend and all, but looking back at the joint training, yeah, they seem pretty close, Owais said, thinking of how many times they ended training together with Midoriya's unit. Even Hatsum from the support course drops by during lunch to eat with them, Siro said, then something else came to his mind. Oh yeah, did you hear that Hato senpai actually asked Midoriya out on a date? No shit, Owais looked at the tape teen with wide eyes. Yeah, and he said no for some reason, apparently. I'll say again, there's no way Deku would get a girl. That big hand girl must be doing that out of pity. Oi, you take that back right now, Tetsutetsu demanded, pointing one finger at Bakugo. And I'll tell you what, the other extras must see him as some hopeless puppy, because there's no other way shitty Deku would get that much attention. Ooh, is that envy I sense, Bakugo? One more lame joke, and I'll blast you from here to your room, dunce face. Yeesh, learn to take a joke, man. But man, I gotta say I feel a little envious too. It's like Midoriya is hoarding all the nice girls we know. Oh, the signal strengthened. They stopped and looked around. Manoma also noticed the change on his side. The signal here also got stronger. It apparently comes from this direction. Monoma and Kaminari pointed in the same direction, exchanging surprised glances. So that meant Kendo, possibly Komori, Shiozaki, and Takage were together with Midoriya, Ashido, and Hagakure. In that direction was a dark hallway with doors on both sides. There wasn't another route right now, so they might as well check it. As they walked down the hallway, the signal got stronger, showing they were getting closer. All the doors they passed seemed to be closed. Then they reached the end of the corridor and were practically on the other side of the building. They could make a turn left or right and enter another area, but the blips were similar to when someone was in the same room as them. Kaminari and Monoma looked around, staring at the two doors at their sides. Checking the doors, one seemed a bit off. The security panel was much more discreet, and the door itself looked designed to blend more into the wall. The only reason why they noticed it was that the signal was pointing them in that direction. Hmm, is this some kind of hidden entrance? Siro thought out loud. Is the tracker pointing towards there, Monona, Kirwaro? Um, yes. The bracelet should be on the other side of the door. The panel works, but we don't have access, Kaminari said, pressing his hand on the panel to scan his hand. Maybe if I give it a shock, it'll get short-fused and... Out of the way, you dumb Pikachu, Bakugo shoved Kaminari aside and stood in front of the door, rubbing his hands. Um, bro, you might get us harmed here in this small enclosed space. Kirishima said with a hint of concern. Just relax and watch, I know I can't use big explosions. Do you think I'm an extra to not know that? Bakugo then planted his sweaty hands on the corners of the door and lined them. Then he prepared some small sparks and slammed his hands on the lines of nitroglycerin sweat. Boom. The door came down violently, a lot of smoke arose. The guys fanned it away, coughing a bit. That trick is new, nice job cough bro. Now, dunce face, go check if shitty Deku is. Hi hi cough I'm gonna check. Back to where we were, the door on the floor, the smoke clearing out, a bunch of girls naked, one of them being their modern hero art history teacher, currently under the mentioned green-haired teen. Oh, and there was a pro-hero too, and the persons the guys were looking for. Have we mentioned their current state of complete nakedness? At the large mattress, the large harem froze in place. This wasn't May's fault at all. She could not predict explosive resistance would be in need in this. At the door, the guys widened their eyes, also in shock both for seeing a considerable amount of nudity gathered in one place and for finding none other than Midoriya, 
The cinnamon roll too pure for this world Izuku right in the middle in fact, apparently about to go down with their R-rated hero and teacher. It was one of these situations or scenes where the more you look, the more messed up it became. Tetsutetsu saw Kendo there, one hand covering her private bits for the minimum of modesty, although looking closer she might not be just covering it. Awais noticed Kodai currently frozen but still pressing herself together and oh my, her reddened face looked so gorgeous. Siro found Ishido and guessed the person she was probably groping, given the context, was Hagakure. Kirawaro had a brief thought of, why does Shiozaki have wings and a halo above her head? Fitting, but why though? Kaminari had an epiphany. All the moments they saw the green teen with the girls, the looks, the giggles, the small chats he ended hearing bits by accident, the whole protection squad, it all came to him and everything made sense. It was all clear now, all the pieces connected, the doubt that floated in their class got confirmed, and in the most spectacular way. In a way, Kaminari was glad he got to witness it in the first person. It was like a sight of a dream coming true, a wild, steamy dream. Kirishima was lost at words and reactions. He knew one or two girls from his class might have a huge crush on Midoriya, and that he was a nice guy, enough to get the attention of the girls around him. But this was just... Once again, he was stuck between seeing this as a manly as hell feat or feeling disappointed. Like, aren't you supposed to choose one girl and live your life with her? But what if you can, Ahim, handle more than one? Monoma's confusion was between feeling envious and competitive about Class 1A as a whole or just about Midoriya, for also getting frisky with the girls from his class. And finally, Bakugo. The moment his eyes laid upon this scene, his brain halted functions of complex order. He just soaked into all the information coming to his eyes for a while. When he made sure he was seeing what he was seeing, and this wasn't some kind of mind trick, illusion, or black magic. When he was 200% sure the scene frozen in front of him wasn't a stupid dream generated by a bunch of extras talking nonsense about shitty Deku and several girls getting close to him. When the realization hit him like a Detroit smash and his brain registered, it was the truth, bare as everyone's butt in that bed. At that moment, Bakugo exploded. Literally. Wow, bro. Are you okay? Kirishima looked at his fallen friend whose hands suddenly went off blasting, pushing Bakugo backward. His eyes whitened out from sheer anger and his mind shut down. Phew, uo. Kaminari held his head in hands, too shocked to form sentences, too focused on the beauties to care. Aya! Ah! A strident, unison squeal of panic and terror sounded as the girls finally broke from the frozen state and got down to cover themselves. Lucky for them, Ibarra had her quirk almost as second nature, so she instinctively made a vine dome with her hair to shield their shameless nudity. Inside it, Izuku still looked in the direction of the door, terror plastered in his face. He shakily looked down at the lady under him. Mimiri closed her eyes, brought a hand to her face, and breathed in deeply. Ah, it had to happen now. The morning after Christmas started rather normally, considering everything that happened the previous night. It was almost as if nothing had happened. That, of course, didn't last at all. So here they were, two women, sitting at the principal's office. The room is dead silent, except for the nervous tapping of the blondie's foot on the floor. The lady with dark purple hair seemed to have the reins of her emotional state, but someone who knew her for a long time could tell she was on the edge. They just received a message to be early at the office, no context, no explanations, but at this point, none were needed. The door opened, and in came a short creature that resembled a mouse, with a rather ugly scar crossing one eye. It quietly walked to the desk, hopping on the chair to sit on it. Funny how nobody ever considered making one more suited to the principal's size, but it wasn't like he felt bothered by it. If nothing, it helped to make the students more at ease whenever he called them over. This couldn't possibly be applied to the two ladies in front of him. I believe we all know why you two are here, correct? Yu slowly raised her hand, but decided to remain silent. Mimiri simply nodded, arms folded over her chest. Well then, I'll jump straight to the problem. 
you two were caught, as they say, red-handed while having intercourse with a group of students by another group of students. Principal Nezu said, pause together and with a very serene albeit serious tone of voice. Not only that, you did it within the school grounds in a modified room. May I ask how Hatsum son got authorization for that? Nimiri slowly raised her hand, head hanging low. I see. I imagine you talked Meijima-san into this by convincing her less safe experiments could be performed there. The dark-haired lady nodded again. You also took advantage of the passive tracking system during nighttime, where you had a time window where everyone involved could gather for special activities. The silence was more than enough of an answer. I hope you understand the severity of these actions, the both of you, but more so Nimiri San, who has been working with me for longer. Letting out a heavy sigh, Nimiri finally looked up at the giant white mouse. Yes, Principal Nezu, I am fully aware that my situation is the definition of problematic. She wouldn't fool herself. Nimiri knew there was a risk, and she did it anyway. There was no use in playing dumb nor denying it. She was busted. Good. That frees me from giving a lecture. Now, about the consequences of said actions, they swallowed dry. Nimiri was expecting to be fired, possibly sued, and in the worst-case scenario, locked up for a while. It wasn't like pro heroes never got jail time, they were not above the law. In this day and age heroes were the ones most held accountable, hence why it was so important to work on your public image. What Nimiri really worried about was exactly the image of Yue fearing what such a scandal would do to it. Yu had a similar worry, but it was a bit more personal to her since her debut was quite recent. She had enough gossip running around while being in a team with Kamui Woods. This could potentially do damage to her reputation that she would never recover from. But honestly, the biggest fear they had was not being able to see Izuku again. Nimiri in particular felt a little guilty having interacted with Midoriya Inko before and she kept in mind the possibility of restraining orders, or even Izuku having to change schools. In the end, his mother had the final say. I won't question the details of your relationship with Midoriya Izuku or any of the girls. All I want to know is, did they consent? Nezu asked calmly. In fact, the question barely registered to them. Pardon, what was that? Nimiri said. I asked if they consented to do it. I mean having sec. Um, they looked surprised at the white mouse. It's a little complicated, but... Again, I'm not asking for details. A yes or no will suffice. Nimiri and you looked at each other. The girls and themselves could be quite demanding when it came to fun time with Izuku. Most of the time, they were the ones initiating it. Yes. They answered together. It wasn't as if Izuku didn't like it. In fact, they always made sure he was having the best experience possible, and there were no complaints so far. Let's ignore the circumstances of their first time together for now. Excellent. Principal Nezu said, jumping from his chair and walking to the table nearby and pouring a cup of tea while Nimiri and Yu followed with their eyes, confused and a little scared. Wait, aren't we in trouble? The blondie asked. Hmm, do you want trouble, Takyama-san? He sipped calmly. I sure don't want it, considering the delicate situation we're in currently. Are we not going to receive any punishment? Nimiri questioned with hesitation. She wasn't particularly looking forward to it, but it was only to be expected, right? Ha 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 ha, Nezu laughed lightly, putting the cup on the table and hopping back on the chair. Of course you will, actions have consequences, you know. The two ladies went stiff. I'm not looking forward to making a public ruckus about this. Everyone involved was consenting and aware of their actions. You two are teachers at UA, and pro heroes, and I'm considering these aggravators. But, he took another sip of his drink, giving a wise look at them. Don't you think it has been strangely convenient? Huh? The confusion in their faces only got more apparent. Did you know that when attracted to someone, humans release a few types of pheromones? It doesn't work like other animals and you can't really detect it, but it is noticeable to me. Also, your brain releases a concoction of hormones and you break down into obsessive-compulsive behavior. 
it's as if you lost brain cells. The two women looked at the white mouse, completely lost about the rambling, which was close enough to one of Izuku's mumbling sprees. Then came the increasing maniacal laughter. Ha 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 ha, humans are such pitiful creatures at times, acting like the superior species when they can fall into such primitive behavior that easily. All it takes is placing them together in a box, an opportunity, and you end with sec crazed animals constantly in heat, how ironic, ha 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 ha. Yu was absolutely terrified at the sight of the laughing and shaking white mouse behind the desk. Even Nimiri, who had witnessed Nezu's true personality before couldn't help but feel anxious about it. In sum, what he said is that, Wait, Principal, you knew about it? The dark-haired lady didn't want to believe it. She was so discreet about that, or so she thought. Please don't diminish my perception, Kayama-san. Although I have to admit you did a pretty good job in pulling the reins of these kids. Even a dense person would notice young Midoriya and the increasing number of, what do they say? Ah, horny girls around him. You noticed even before we joined? Good thing she was sitting, because you felt her legs losing strength. Under other circumstances, her image and possibly her career would be done for. Just how smart was that mouse? Yes, I knew it all along. Then, why did you allow them us to go that far? Mimuri asked. Why, you ask? Hmm, he took another sip of the remaining tea that didn't spill while he laughed. I thought it would be a fun experiment. Ha 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 ha. The white mouse kept laughing and spilling tea from the cup while the two adults processed just how lucky they were in this situation. Ah, it was an interesting experience, I must admit. Now, for the aforementioned consequences, Nezu began, bringing his paws together. Nimiri and you felt a little bead of sweat form on their foreheads. First of all, you'll have to deal with two classes knowing about your little secret. If it happens to spread around the school, I'm afraid there's nothing much you can do about it. Rather, you're not allowed to. The previous night. Guys, 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 you won't believe what I just saw. Everyone, wake the hell up. This is the big news, Kaminari barged into the dorms, knocking on door after door to wake up the remaining students of Class 1A. In a relatively short time, all the boys were gathered in the common room. The ones who stayed behind had sleepy eyes and practically dragged themselves out of the warm comfort of their rooms. As for the exploration team, the generalized state was of shock. Kaminari was also extremely excited. Bakugo was still passed out and foaming from his mouth, hence why Kirishima had to carry him back. Surprisingly, or maybe not, Todoroki seemed pretty unmoved by this whole convo. Damn it, Kaminari, you better have a nice body picture for waking me up like that, shouted the midget of the class. We, Kaminari-kun, I'm losing my beauty sleep here. Even in that semi-conscious state, Aoyama never lost his shine. This is yawn like being consumed by the dark, Takoyami said, barely awake. Kaminari kun you should not be making that level of noise late at night. I understand the excitement of festive times, but such disruptive behavior is not acceptable and... Ida, just let him yawn say it and be over with it. Ojiro placed a hand on the class rep's shoulder. Ida looked a little taken back, but he had to admit he was feeling too tired to keep going on a full lecture. Y'all will wake up when I tell you this. We noticed some of us were missing and went out to look for them. This seemed to get the attention of the boy with glasses. Missing? What happened? Did you find them? Oh, we found them all right, he he. Kaminari looked left and right, with a grin as wide as his face allowed. We found him in a room with all the girls, and the girls from 1B, and Kayama-sensei and Takeyama-san too, completely naked. There was a solid minute of silence in the room as the half-asleep boys stared at the excited blonde. Not exactly the reaction he was expecting. Yeah, that happened, Sato joked, shaking his head. If Kaminari wanted to pull a prank on them, he had to do better than that. Kaminari kun, even as a joke, it is not right to say this kind of thing about our classmates and teachers. Not to mention, Ida let a long yawn. It is definitely too late for that. Wait, I'm not joking guys, Midoriya was really in a room full of naked girls. 
I know there's a situation going on in our class, but I think that's too much. I mean, going out is a thing, but that. We all know Midoriya, right? Shoji said. He did overhear some comments by accident, but as usual, decided not to mention it. Lessons learned from previous experiences in his life. Kaminari, if you woke me up just to share your wet dream, then I'd rather go back to bed and have my own, Minta exclaimed, already trying to conjure the image his blonde friend suggested, but with him in place of Midoriya. He's not lying, though. We saw it too. Damn Midoriya, Ciro said from his place on the couch. He looked still a bit shocked. Yeah, I wouldn't believe either if I wasn't there myself, Kirishima added. How do we know you two are not playing along too? Ojiro asked. And why is Bakugo knocked out and foaming? Ayama pointed at the still unconscious team. Ah, I think he got too angry and passed out, Kirishima said in a nonchalant manner. Somehow, this was sort of expected. And if you don't trust us, then ask Todoroki and Baku bro when he wakes up. He pointed a finger at Todoroki, who seemed to be contemplating something since they arrived, while he put his knocked-out friend on the couch. Well, tell us then, Todoroki. Did you really see Midoriya in a room full of naked girls? Sato asked with a mocking tone. Yeah, how was the view like? Minta followed the taunt. Todoroki, with his everlasting plain face, delved into deep thought. You can say it was pretty hot. And as he said that, his right shoulder burst in flames. Wait, that thing on his face, was Todoroki blushing. The half-and-half half teen didn't have the best sense of humor, and he could pass as pretty naive and oblivious at times when outside of hero duty. So if Todoroki was saying that, it meant. Realization slowly dawned on them, and as their faces started to gain a look of shock, Kaminari chuckled. Oh yeah, I didn't tell you the best part yet he said with a smug smile. Wait, there's more? Minta held on to Kaminari's shirt, suddenly invested in knowing every detail about this event. They were not only naked, oh no, Midoriya was about to go down on Kayama sensei Now you got to be kidding me, said the midget. I swear I'm not. I think, I think they all were about to FCK him. Another minute in utter silence passed. Ee? -e? Well, now they were all awake. So can't we tell them to keep it secret? You pleaded with the white mouse. You can ask them, Takyama-san, but using your positions as teachers to enforce it is something I will not tolerate. As the adults in the room, I expect you to handle this situation accordingly. The blondie groaned in advance annoyance. She would never be looked the same by the brats, she was sure of it. I assume trying to bypass this rule will get us fired? Kiyama asked. Why, yes. I won't lie, the thought did cross my mind, and I even pondered putting Aizawa's method into action, but a look around was enough to make me reconsider. We are already spread thin with pro-heroes. Expelling roughly a third of our first-year students from the hero course? Over such a reason? All things considered, it is overkill. Finally, the two of them felt some resemblance of relief. That doesn't mean you are out of the hook yet. Back to tension. While the two grown-up ladies were at the principal's office, back at the dorms, the emerald child peeked outside his room, opening his door only enough for a slit. The entire building seemed awfully quiet, even more considering all the noise of the previous night. It didn't matter how much time passed, this was unavoidable, they had to go back to the dorms. And judging by Kaminari's reaction, everybody in Wana already knew of their secret. Delaying it wouldn't help at all, so back to the dorms went the group. They split in two, each one going to their respective class buildings. Midoriya told the girls to wait outside a bit as he went inside first. He hoped the attention would be drawn to him so they could just go straight to their rooms without the guys asking questions. The green team gently opened the door. Midoriya! A group of voices shouted, and before he knew, Midoriya was pulled inside, being immediately surrounded by his friends. Oi Midoriya, what the hell is this story of you and all the girls in a room? Sato asked. You saw them all naked, didn't you? shouted the midget, crying blood tears and pulling his shirt. Midoriya Kun, as the class rep, I can't allow such raunchy behavior. We're in school grounds and... 
You touched their bosoms, didn't you? Did you really get all of them to sleep with you? Like, all of them? Ajiro said, with a hint of hopelessness in his voice. You had them all over you, didn't you? Midoriya, my man, you gotta learn how to share, Kaminari said, wrapping one arm around Midoriya's neck and pulling him closer. Do you think you can set me up with Kyoka-chan? I never asked you anything, please. You got them all in line and slapped them with your... Dekuu, regardless of the noise, this shout simply muffled everything else. Mine to shut up, and they all looked at the couch. Midoriya flinched. Oh, you're awake, Baku bro. As the explosive teen shot up, his eyes landed on the green-haired teen, and he leaped over the couch, stomping all the way to the crowd, which opened up as he passed. Bakugo had a vice grip on Midoriya's shirt, dragging his freckled face dangerously close to a hand letting out tiny explosions. What was that, you damn nerd? Midoriya leaned back a little. It had been quite some time since he found himself in this position with Bakugo, and he wasn't thrilled to relive the memories. As usual, he held his hands up in defense. L, listen, Kaken, I see can explain that. How did an absolute loser like you got that many girls? Ha! Did you beg them to be their pet? And no, that's not it. I, uh, Midoriya looked to the side by reflex, and he noticed how everyone had a kinda suspicious look towards him. Ah, uh, guys, I can explain. His prediction proved to be true, however. Midoriya, not to be the prick, but did you pay them or something? Siro asked awkwardly. Yeah, bro, we thought you were dating Itsuka. That's not very manly of you, Kirishima held a look of minor disappointment. Midoriya-kun, as the class rep and your friend, I must insist that you explain this situation and your relationship with our girl classmates. Ida also seemed to look down on him. The boy didn't know where to put his face. It's a bit complicated, but I... Shut up, die, say it already, shitty Deku. What is he supposed to do, Bakugo? Pick one, why? he said between a gnarl. Eh? Bakugo shook a little, which made Midoriya a bit concerned. Kaken, are you okay? Why does an absolute worthless piece of shit like you get all this attention? Midoriya prepared himself to get an explosion to the face at point-blank range. It used to be like that back at middle school, except for a certain voice inside his head telling him to stand up to himself. He was none of these insulting words Bakugo constantly had at him. He had value, he was worthy, and most importantly, he was loved, and no short-tempered blonde douchebag would change that. But before he had the opportunity to fight back, someone beat him to it. There was a flash of brunette, and in the next second, Bakugo was on the floor, legs up, folded in half in a weird position. His eyes were wide as he failed to fully understand what just happened. The answer stood before him as he raised his eyes to look at the culprit, a brunette with bob hair that seemed to float, rosy cheeks and little pads on her fingertips. She stood between Shitty Deku and him and the rest of the crowd in a defensive position. She looked quite angry. Now that's enough. You're a raka? Midoriya exclaimed, equally surprised, then pulled her close by the shoulder. I told you and the girls to go straight upstairs, he whispered. I know, but how could I? This would end with you being blamed again. She whispered back, then turned around and gave an intimidating glare at the boys, who even took a step back. So anyone else have something funny to say? The brunette scanned their faces, hands on her hips and tapping her foot in anger. Ida fixed his glasses and cleared his throat. While he inwardly cheered for Yuraka coming to aid Midoriya, supporting his personal ship, this situation was definitely not ideal. At least she managed to defuse the conflict, and he was glad for it. Yuraka san as the class rep I require that Midoriya explain this situation so we can avoid any misunderstandings. He was surprisingly civil about it. You would expect someone like Ida to call them out on deviant behavior. Perhaps his efforts to become more flexible extend farther than only the circle of being a pro-hero. Still, they were dancing around eggshells here, and the eyes kept focused on Midoriya. For the best or worst case, he would be responsible for everything that happened in their eyes. She was troubled about how to proceed since she acted on a whim. 
seeing Bakugo say those things about her love made her blood boil, and before realizing it, Yoraka already tossed the explosive teen over her shoulder. Her eyes traveled to a corner of the room, where the rest of the girls were, peeking in silence with equally worried faces. Then, an idea lit up in her head. Rather, it was a snap. They had dragged this lie far enough already. Sigh avoid misunderstandings, right? Well, if you need to know that bad, she started, looking her classmates dead in the eye. A bright red hue took over her cheeks. Deku Khan and I, we are D, D dating for a while now. Not only that, we had a sec too, a lot of times, uh, and that's it. Say whatever you want about me, I don't care, but I won't let anyone talk shit about Deku Khan, not even you, Bakugo. Yuraraka said the last part looking at the blondie getting back on his feet, anger very apparent in his face. She didn't have any problems telling Midoriya she loved him, but something about this situation and the way their relationship was revealed made her feel nervous. But honestly, why should she be ashamed of it? She loved him, and he loved her, end of the story. TCH dating? Cut that bullshit. She looked at him with a confused face. How much did you get from that nerd? Oi, Baku bro, that's going too far. Kirishima held on to his shoulder, but Bakugo simply pushed his hand away. Are you kidding me? It all makes sense now. Why princess broke here, and all of these hoes too? He cast a glance at the corner, and he could see the girls glaring daggers at him. TCH, that's the only way Deku would get anyone in bed. Me, princess, does he pay you extra to be nice to him, or you just make a friendly price out of pity? Katsuki For the second time that night, Bakugo was caught completely off guard. His head jerked back and his body followed, being stopped by some force holding to his shirt. A stinging sensation started to spread in his face, beginning from his nose, so he naturally brought a hand up. Was that blood? Deku, he didn't quite say the name, for it was closer to a low pitch growl. In a flash, Midoriya moved past Yuraraka and punched Bakugo square in the face, holding on to his shirt and bringing him to look him in the eye. To say the green teen was pissed was an understatement. Bastard, what do you think you're doing? Apologize. Huh? I said apologize to Yuraraka and all the others. Feeling an eye twitch, Bakugo mirrored the grip on his shirt. The nerve of that nerd, he was the one who did that. Oi, Deku, do you think you can act up just because you lost your virginity with a bunch of bitches? I told you to apologize, you piece of shit. Perhaps it was Midoriya cursing, or maybe it was the two of them raising fists to beat the shit out of each other. But before they could transform the common room into a fighting arena, the other boys intervened, pulling the two of them apart and restraining them. Good thing Sato and Shoji were the taller and bulkier ones around, but even then, stopping those two from killing each other was proving to be a challenging task. Let go of me, Deku, I'm gonna explode you to hell. Try me, you arrogant cunt, one more word about them, and I'll Detroit smash you to the moon. Enough, the both of you. That was the class rep, asserting his authority as such. Everyone looked at the tall teen with glasses, as this never happened before. Taking a deep breath, Ida tried to center himself again. He was not awake enough now to deal with this kind of problem. Bakugo kun please watch your profanity. I really mean it this time. Midoriya kun if you would prevent further injuries, it would help a lot. Now again, Yuraraka san Please explain this mess. As everyone seemed to calm down, the attention was focused on the brunette, which made her a little nervous, but she brushed that aside. Since it has come to it, she might as well tell them the whole truth. I know you all had your suspicions, and they are true. All of them. Me, Tsu-chan, Mina, Momo-chan, everyone from 1B and even Hatsum, from the support course, were all dating Deku-kun. More than simply dating, to be honest. So what happens now, huh? Silence. The mood was extremely heavy, thanks to Bakugo insinuating a couple of things. Of course, none of them thought that of their girl classmates, but still, it was kinda hard to avoid that label, hence why Ida addressed Midoriya now. Midoriya-kun, where do you stand in this? B. 
the Emerald Child, still glaring daggers at Bakugo, tried to answer his friend the best he could. To be honest, I was kinda dragged into it, but I can't say I didn't agree. We all did that willingly if that's what you meant to ask. He then took a step forward and held Uraraka's hand in his, much to her surprise and of everyone around them. D. Deku-kun? She looked at him, confused and blushing. There's no point in hiding I love. Okay, perhaps saying that word right now was a bit too embarrassing. That we like each other, all right? The mood was still heavy, but at least it was shifting into the awkward kind. And taking that as a cue, the other girls joined them, standing beside and behind Midoriya. As Uraraka said, what happens now? If you guys have something to say, you might as well say it to all of us at once. Said Yeyurazu, holding on to Midoriya's free hand. Okay, wait. So, just to confirm, you all have been dating the same guy for a while now? Kaminari asked. His answer was a collective nod. Why, though? I admit Midoriya is a cool dude, but Gyro. Eh? What? She looked surprised at the blondie as he walked to her, holding on to her shoulders. Come on, I know I'm not the brightest, but can't we, like, at least try and go out? I could make that work, I... It pained Gyro to do that. She kinda knew Kaminari might harbor some feelings for her. She didn't want to be rude, so she kept him around as a friend. She thought that not giving any hints of interest beyond that would be enough to deliver the message, and that was before she got involved with Midoriya. Sorry, Kaminari, I... I already like him. It's not that you're not a cool person, it's just... She tried to give an apologetic smile, but it was hard to do so when the usually upbeat blondie looked so down. Sigh okay, I get it. He arrived first. It's fair, I guess. Still, all of you? Really? He said, looking at the group of girls. They simply shrugged. Ah, you know what? I'm going to bed. This is a lot of stuff to process. Damn, all of them. Kaminari left mumbling a few things to himself. And as if following his lead, the other boys started to head back to their rooms. The energy of the shocking news left their systems, and that commotion between Bakugo and Midoriya only served to tire them out even more. Sigh, I guess I never stood a chance to begin with, Ojiro said, glancing at the floating set of clothes among the girls. Don't be so down, Monami. I know you'll find another girl who doesn't draw a lot of attention. The tailed teen wasn't sure whether to take this as Aoyama cheering him up or roasting his plain looks. Having one girlfriend seems like a lot of work, but six, no thanks, Sato said. Technically, it would be thirteen, right? Shoji added. Yeah, I'll definitely pass. Takoyami, was that? Yes, dark shadow, of the highest form, revelry in the dark. Both the bird-headed teen and his sentient shadow said, leaving the room to commune in the realm of nightmares. Oi, Minta, what are you doing? Siro asked, looking at the midget fervently rubbing his hands and mumbling some gibberish, eyes closed shut. He got a little closer and, a cursitoy wa cursitoy wa cursitoy wa cursitoyu. A splinter stuck under your nail, hit the pinky on a table leg, miss every bus by a minute, just one side of your phone works, step in a puddle, runny nose on the weekends, rainy Mondays, trip on the doormat. Dude, get over it, it's not the end of the world. You're only saying that because you had a glimpse of paradise, Ciro. The purple midget burst, crying blood tears. Erm, I ah, uh, it's not like they're the only girls we'll ever meet, right? Ignoring the sheer amount of ridiculousness in the scene he had witnessed, Ciro internally admitted it was pretty cool. It's not something you see every day, you know, and the tape boy secretly hoped some of Midoriya's mysterious charms would rub on him. You would never get it, Ciro, my hopes shattered and ground to dust. Stop with the drama, Minta. We both know you would never score with any of them. Now get up and stop chanting the thousands of mild inconveniences said the tape boy, practically leaving the room with Minta under his arm like luggage, but not before the crying midget pointed an accusing finger at Midoriya. I hope you get tired of them and turn gay, you dream-shattering playboy. Shut up, it's already too late for that. Even with fewer people in the room, the tension in the air was still high enough to send sparks flying. 
Bakugo and Midoriya were still grabbing each other's imaginary necks and punching conceptual faces. Sensing this, Ida made another effort to try and defuse this ticking bomb. This kind of problem had to be addressed as soon as possible. Bakugo kun, Midoriya kun, let's be adults here and set the personal affairs aside from school and hero duty. Whatever you say, shitty glasses. I don't give a damn about how this loser got so many girls. I still didn't hear you apologize, Kaken. Ha, huh, did they suck your brain along, Deku? You, Midoriya took a step towards Bakugo, who was waiting with hands open, tiny explosions crackling on his palm. However, the green teen felt a cold touch on his shoulder. Looking slightly to the side, he tried to keep his anger down while talking to Todoroki. Todoroki-kun, let go. The half-and-half half boy slowly shook his head. I usually say it to Bakugo, but you need to cool your head down, Midoriya. The green teen tightened his fists, knuckles going white. He knew Todoroki and Ida were right, but he couldn't let Kaken get away with calling them that. What kind of boyfriend or man he would be if he did so. Deku-kun, his attention turned to the other side. Yuraraka held his bald fist, and it was as if her eyes drained the anger from him. The damage is done. It can't get much worse than this. She wasn't sure of it, but Yuraraka had to placate the fury of her boyfriend. TCH, I see who is calling the shots here. Bro, that's enough already. Kirishima pulled back Hugo back, a little less friendly than usual. The explosive team would let that one time slide. Get off my case, Kirishima. These extras are so desperate they stuck with some loser like Deku. Hey, you all, when you get tired of that limp, call me and I might show you something real. Bakugo-kun, this behavior is way beyond what is acceptable between classmates. It's okay, Ida-kun, Yayurazu politely cut him, staring at the explosive teen. You know, Bakugo, you seem especially put off by Midoriya and us being in a relationship. If I didn't know you, I would say you're jealous of him, Yayurazu held a smirk that seriously pissed him off. What do you put in your tea? I'll be dead before I feel jealous of shitty Deku. Well, you seem suo serious shouting there's no way muscles here could get any of us in bed. Yet that happened. Multiple times. Ashido quickly caught on to Yeomomo's idea. Oh, for sake, if your standard is him, then you can't possibly get any lower. Keep telling yourself that back you go. But the fact is that in this matter Deku-kun is leagues above you, said Yuraka, taunting him with a smug smile. One by one, the girls were clinging more and more onto Midoriya. Ribbit, maybe Bakugo-kun isn't jealous of him, but he actually wanted Midoriya-chan for himself. What? Say that again if you want to die, frog girl. I see, I see you should be more open and straightforward about those things, Bakugo-kun, Hagakir joined the tease, followed by Gyro. Well, we can't really blame him, right? I mean, it's hard to ignore all this, said the purple-haired girl, pointing at Midoriya as a whole, biting her lower lip. Judging by the grinding teeth and veins popping out, Bakugo was close to his limit. Not that it took a lot of effort, most of the time. Then, a certain voice inside Midoriya's mind reminded him of something. The offer is still up, Kaken. If you behave, I might show you something real. Bakugo would probably explode with anger again, but this time Kirishima managed to hold the blonde in place. Though he didn't fully agree on that, Midoriya standing his ground was something nice and manly to see. The red-haired boy just wished his two friends had less aggressive ways of talking. Whatever, who wants a bunch of used-up sluts anyway? Bakugo didn't leave time for Midoriya nor Ida to come after him. Turning around and stomping his feet back to his room, hands shoved into his pockets, grumbling and snarling all the way. Look, bro, I'm not sure about it, but as long as you all are happy, I guess, Kirishima said, scratching his head awkwardly. He couldn't help but look at Ishido, who by chance met with his eyes. He flinched a bit and looked away, taking this as his cue to leave. That left only Todoroki and Ida with them now. Midoriya Khan, to be honest, I'm pretty shocked that you of all people would get into such a situation. 
I'm also going to state that I do not approve of such behavior, as we should all strive to be the best students and heroes possible. The school grounds are not a place for, ahem. Anyway, it is beyond my power to stop you so, don't do anything recklessly. I'll also need to report this to the principal. Yeah, I know. Midoriya was already feeling tired in advance for whatever waited for them tomorrow. As expected, they wouldn't simply let that one slide. Sorry if I let you down, it's really more complicated than it looks like. No need to apologize. I understand not everyone shares my world views, I just wasn't expecting, um, you and all of them, really? Midoriya raised hands with an awkward smile. If someone told him a couple months ago he would get a huge harem of girls after him, the green teen would call them completely crazy. Life took a lot of unexpected turns ever since he met All Might in person. And with that, the tall teen with glasses dismissed himself, leaving Midoriya alone in the room with the girls. And Todoroki. Midoriya. W.H. what? The icy hot teen was so quiet he actually forgot about his presence. Todoroki had that blank expression plastered on his face. He calmly rested a hand on Midoriya's shoulder, heterochromatic eyes staring deeply into his emerald green ones. This went on in silence long enough to unearth the incredibly shy and awkward Midoriya again. It was like Todoroki was trying to look into his soul or past him, and Midoriya could only stare back with similar intensity. Todoroki apparently glanced quickly at something else, then focused on Midoriya again. Congratulations, he said casually. Ah, uh, thanks, does that mean Todoroki approves of his harem? More importantly, why would he do that, Todoroki-kun? Yes? Um, your shoulder is on fire. Oh. He had been staring at Yeyurazu and his mind went to places. I see you're fully committed, but I want to say again. Take good care of them. Sure, reading Todoroki's emotions could be difficult at times, but Midoriya felt genuine goodwill from the half-cold, half-hot teen. And as Todoroki left, Midoriya turned around to face his girlfriends. Well, what now? No one had a good answer, so they simply shrugged. Guess they would have to wait until morning. Again at the principal's office. And since Kayama-san went the extra mile to find a secret room, Here's another rule. Within the school grounds, you two are to keep distance from the involved students, safe for the class period, of course. Well, what exactly does keep distance equate to? asked Kayama. Physical distancing and no contact of any kind. Wait, not even texting? You looked disheartened. Not a single sort of contact beyond the necessary. I'd rather not be accused of allowing a brothel in UA. I hope you understand. They nodded silently. I expect you two to be perfectly professional about it. The school is not a place for this kind of activity, so I'll be very explicit. Please refrain from such activities with our students within UA limits. Have some restraint. Why, yes, they said, trying to hide the faint blush crossing their cheeks. At the one of dorms, Midoriya was ready to head to Principal Nezu's office. He talked to Ida and decided it would be better if Midoriya simply told what happened. But before he and the girls, who also decided to follow, could even leave, none other than Aizawa-sensei appeared. Needless to say, they felt pretty nervous. The scruffy man looked at the group of teens staring at him as a defendant looks at the judge, waiting for the sentence. It seemed that they had a good idea of why he was here. Rubbing his tired eyes, the teacher simply went straight to the point. Don't bother going to the principal's office, he's aware of your current situation. And here is what's going to happen. That secret room is going to be closed, and if we catch any of you, or any other student for that matter, getting too intimate, it will result in expulsion. That surely wasn't the outcome they were expecting. So, we're not expelled? Hagakure asked, with a hand raised. Not yet. After pondering over it, the principal decided this is not worth getting all of you out, and I agree to some extent. He said, nonchalantly. Why you do, they said in surprise. Don't misinterpret my words. I personally don't care about how you lead your personal life, so long as it doesn't interfere with your student and hero duties. 
Of course, I'm forced to state the obvious and tell you not to do this kind of thing here, lest you really want to be expelled. It seems they got extremely lucky this time. Aside from the mixed reactions of their classmates and the possibility of being the hot topic of gossip for the following years, things didn't seem that bad. Um, what about Takeyama-san and Kayama-sensei? Yayurazu raised her hand hesitantly. Their situation was apparently solved, but it was probably more concerning to the two of them. Principal Nezu called them early to his office, they should be almost done by now. I don't think they're going anywhere if that's what you're worried about. The group let out a collective sigh of relief. Why do you look so relieved? Aizawa asked them, earning some confused looks. You all are getting one month of house arrest for breaking curfew, and that includes your friends from 1B and 1H. One month? Isn't that too much? Do you want to get two months then, Ashido? No. House arrest or not, it was still manageable. At least they would have a lot of time to spend together, and in hindsight, now there was really no reason to hide their displays of affection, at least within the confines of their class. Sadly, it would be a whole month without Midoriya for the girls from 1B and Hatsum. Well then, since we got it all sorted out, you're dismissed. Your house arrest starts right after you return from your parents' homes. Happy New Year. Aizawa finished as he walked away, leaving the group of teens to their own devices. The scruffy man made his way to the principal's office. Sekijiro would give the notice to 1B and Majima would have the pleasure of informing Hatsum. Knowing the pink-haired girl, one month away from the development studio would be the worst kind of torture. The same couldn't exactly be said about his students, however. What the house arrest caused them was an urgency to catch up on the missed progress something no one wanted, even more being under his watch. Aizawa leaned on the wall next to the doorway, right on time for Takeyama and Kayama to leave the office. The blonde woman looked quite broody, mumbling some unintelligible words as she waddled her way down the corridor. The other one noticed him right away, stopping as she closed the door behind her. Eyes closed, she took in a deep breath, running a hand through her long strands. Sai, you must think I'm a freak. Kayama didn't have to look at him to know. After so much time working together, she could read him even if most of his emotions were hidden behind those tired and seemingly uncaring eyes. I don't have anything in mind. He said back, nonchalant as always. Of course you have, even more considering your kids got involved. You should show them more appreciation, you know? I think you have done that for the both of us already. She knew there was a smirk behind that scarf, even if tiny. She turned to him, one hand resting on her hips. So what now? Are you going to avoid me too aside from professional work? Honestly, I wouldn't blame you. I do feel like a freak. You didn't before getting caught? He asked bluntly, and as such, Kayama was surprised by the question. Uh, not really. Look, it's weird, I know, but I love that kid. Not just like him, or as a pet or a plaything, as everyone assumes I do. You do give them reasons to make these assumptions. TCH, I'm very aware of that, thank you. However, there's more to me than just the R-rated hero, and I can show that with him. I, I think I never felt like that before, she finished, rubbing her arm as she stared at the floor. Then, a chuckle from the other teacher got her attention. Kayama looked up at Aizawa with a mild angry and indignant face. Mocking her honest feelings for the emerald child was something she would not allow. Just like she could read him pretty well, Aizawa could see her emotional state. Calm down, I'm not making fun of you. I just find it amusing, it's all. He said, waving a hand and walking past her and through the door to the principal's office. To think this is what would make you settle down, how cute. Hey? Kayama didn't have time to add more into that talk, and to make things worse, she turned around in shock and Aizawa had a very good view of her features, bright pink cheeks and all. Oh, that smug smile on his face. It was something very few people witnessed and usually was relegated as a pure myth. Yet, there it was. That man was having a blast with this situation, wasn't he? Ah, it's been so long since we had a meal together, right, Izuku? 
Inko happily ate her ramen noodles, letting the warmth of the food permeate her body. The smell of seasoning and freshly cooked meat was all around the kitchen. Sigh, I just wish both of you could be here. Across the table, on the vacant place, a tablet sat, showing a known face for both the green heads. I know, I know. Sorry I couldn't make it this year, the office is chaotic now, and we're running on a tight schedule. None other than Midoriya Hasashi virtually attending the family meeting this year. The Midoriya household had a tradition of eating homemade noodles every New Year's Eve, something Inko and Hisashi did since before they started dating. Sure, it was instant noodles back then, so the green-haired lady took them into her hands to improve the tradition a bit. Anyway, you look so grown up, Izuku, I wish I could be there to see it myself. The man was as much of a doting parent as his wife, and Hisashi didn't miss an opportunity to pridefully brag about his son at the hero course. As for said teen, Izuku scratched his head shyly. Thanks, Dad. It's been tough, but I think I'm making a lot of progress. Humph, tough is an understatement. I swear, my hair is losing color with all that stress. Inko had always been a worrywart for her son, so this reaction was only natural. Again, Izuku laughed awkwardly. He had his share of guilt in that, overexerting himself, breaking his arms. But at least for a while, they could have some peace and tranquility together as a family. One year has passed since Izuku got enrolled at UA. And so much has happened already. It was enough to send them in a doozy. However, it was only the start of his path to becoming a hero, the number one at that. Izuku couldn't help but fall into introspection, as he once again steeled his resolve to complete the mission given to him by his idol and mentor, All Might, so he didn't notice his mother calling him. Izuku. W.H. what? She playfully pouted, shaking her head. Seriously, how can I enjoy the company of my two dearest persons when you're with your mind in who knows where? Sorry, I really spaced out for a moment. They shared a light laugh. An angry Inko was a sight exuding cuteness, even for an adult lady. But then, the father held a sly grin towards his son. Hmm, thinking about your girlfriend, Izuku? Izuku choked on his food. Cough, cough, gee, girlfriend? It was less the idea of having one, and more the faint possibility of his father somehow knowing about his less than conventional relationships. Of course, this panic attack was short-lived, as there was no way his father of all people would know that. I, I wasn't thinking of my girlfriend. Oh, so you do have one? Nice. Whoops. And when will you introduce her to us, dear? It's that pink-haired girl with the black eyes, isn't it? Inko quickly got into the game with her husband, also being very interested in learning how popular her son was at school. Ashido? Why do you think she's my girlfriend, okay? Maybe his mom was on to something. Well, she looked so distressed when I came to visit you at the hospital, and she did say she was the last one to see you before you were, you know, so I was wondering if you two were... And not really, we're just good friends. Izuku didn't want to reveal that to his parents yet. He wanted to do it the right way, with both his parents and all of the girls present. Why, he felt like this would be the best way to explain. He wasn't really thrilled for that honestly. Izuku had no idea of how his parents would react. Hmm, is that so? His mom had a smug smile plastered across her face. How about that other pink-haired girl I saw with you at the dorms? You two seemed pretty close. Hatsume is, she's kind of my, uh, special, development, partner. Well, she did make him some support gear, and they had a special thing going on all right, so Izuku wasn't lying at all. He was just being selective of the info he was sharing. Fufufu, it's good to see you're making good friends, Izuku dear. But I must say, keep your eye open. Your class has some really cute girls, you know. Mom. Oh ho? It must be hard for you to walk around with all these girls after you, huh? Dad. It is only to be expected, our Izuku inherited your good looks, honey. And your charms too, dear. The parents laughed as their son tried to hide his face from embarrassment. They were having fun now, but Izuku feared how his parents would react. But at least for now, he didn't have to worry too much about it. 
Deku Khan, do you have to go? Yuraraka whined. She was sitting next to Midoriya at the table, hugging his arm and leaning on his shoulder. Midoriya was in his school uniform and the case with his hero costume was next to him on the floor. The brunette, on the other hand, was in her everyday clothes, long-sleeved shirt and sweatpants since it was still cold, even inside the dorms. I got four days per week for this work-study, Yuraraka. He calmly explained, taking a bite of his toast. He then planted a kiss on her forehead and left. Even with the house arrest, they were still going to the agencies for the hero work studies. The contracts were signed before the revelation of Deku's uh, special circle, so he and the girls were allowed to go out. Classes were still a no-go, which was very concerning. The number of subjects they would miss was simply too big, leading to a monumental task of catching up on everything. And the cherry of the cake being house arrested meant that their ways of avoiding Himiko were severely reduced. Ni ni Ochako-chan, let's watch something together. The blondie poked the brunette, hopping in the same place like an excited little kid. Yuraraka didn't bother trying to hide her annoyed face. You still have classes to attend, Toga. Now get off me, she said, pushing Himiko away as the blondie decided to go for hugs. I don't want to go to school if you're not coming too. Izuku won't be there either, and I'll be alone, Himiko whined, still trying to get a solid hold on Yuraraka, who pushed her face back. And how is this my problem? This house arrest only happened because you all were caught jumping Izuku's bones and gunhead martial arts. Yuraraka quickly removed Himiko's weight and flipped her over the shoulder. The move wasn't complete and Himiko was agile enough to plant her feet on the floor. The brunette just had to release some of that pent-up frustration and get the blondie out of her case. Sigh, I should have asked Deku Kun what agency he was going to. Now I can't see him during most of the week because our schedules don't match and he's working on weekends too. A metaphorical gray cloud formed over her head as the bummed brunette ate her breakfast, pouting and grumbling. Hmm, do you think I could get into the same agency he is if I asked nicely? Yuraraka wished she had laser eyes as her quirk right now, although her stare at the blondie was already pretty intense. The emerald teen walked through the campus with a bit of haste in his step. His destination, the 1H dorms. He had to pick up his support gear as Hatsum insisted on checking and calibrating everything before he left. The house arrest prevented her from accessing the development studio, but she still had her personal tools in her room. Of course, the pinkette brought her entire garage to UA. Why wouldn't she? Just a last check, she said, currently busy with the Air Force gloves. I am done. Here you go, baby. All calibrated, reinforced, and polished. Try not to bend them in non-Euclidean ways this time, okay? Sorry about last time again, he said, picking up the gear and putting it in his costume case. It's okay, baby. That kind of stuff happens all the time, and I kinda need it to happen to make improvements. I also changed the springs on your iron soles so they're packing a little more. She held a proud smile on her face. Attending to the needs of the customer, even when they are not aware of it, is a skill every developer must have if they mean serious business. Thanks again, May. Um, and how are things around here? Judging by the few glances he got once her classmates opened the door, everyone was aware of his relationship with Hatsum and everything else. Oh, it's kinda the same. Some of them said it was obvious that I had feelings for you. They just didn't expect, you know? All the rest, ha ha ha. I, I see. But man, being locked out of the development studio for a month, can't I shorten my sentence with community service? I have the perfect baby for cleaning around. Just a few tweaks on that debris remover and I'll be done in seconds. I think it would be counterproductive. Not that Izuku didn't trust May's skills, but she had a history with her inventions failing catastrophically. Even more without a thorough testing phase. Well, I won't hold you here any longer. Call me if anything feels strange or makes a weird noise, okay? Uh, should I be worried? No, no, uh, call that insurance. After giving May a quick peck on the lips, Izuku exited her room and the 1H building heading to the school's entrance gate. 
He was off to his hero work study at Rukiyu's agency. But on the way, his phone rang, and would you look at that, it was Kendo. Good morning, Itsuka. Morning, Izuku. Yawn. Long night? Sort of, I had to make a few explanations and put out some fires. Oh, how did it go over there? Well, ah, I can't believe this. The blonde teen stormed inside the building of 1B dorms, fuming. A waste followed after, his face completely red. After him, the pitch black teen. It was hard to tell what was Kiriwaro's current state of mind. And finally, Tetsu Tetsu, head low and completely silent. As the door closed behind them, Monoma kept ranting, making noise so the entire building could hear. How? How did we let it get to this stage? He paced back and forth, clearly angry. Um, Monoma, my dude, I know this is kinda shocking and all. I'm dumbstruck too, trust me, but I think you're barking at the wrong tree. Don't you see, Oase? This is clearly a challenge to us, that damned one, eh? No, Midoriya Izuku, we can't let this slip by. I kinda agree this can't be simply ignored, but your reasons are kinda off. Who cares about the reasons, and for whatever was happening in there anyway, Kiriwaro said nonchalantly. Really, man, doesn't it bother you that Midoriya was, well, getting intimate with our girlfriends, and his girlfriends, and two teachers? Awais questioned him, to which Kiriwaro shrugged. If they were with him, it was because they wanted to, so it's not my problem. Aw, oh, come on, not even a bit, he was dating Kendo. She was there too. A faint sound of metal grinding could barely be heard. I don't know, so many girls after one guy, there has to be a reason behind it. Are you saying Midoriya did something to force them? I mean, that doesn't happen normally, does it? Fair enough, but Midoriya doesn't look like the kind of guy to pull a dirty trick for sec. I know where you're coming from, really, but still, I would never imagine him, of all people. TCH, to think I let him infiltrate so easily, that serves to show we can't let our guard down when it comes to 1A. Monoma grumbled to himself. Awais, you better start working out, we're going to get ourselves a harem double the size of Midoriya's. What the hell? Why me too? More sounds of metal clanking. Oi oi, what is going on here? It's too early for all this shouting. The noise in the common room went up and awakened some of the other boys who had to come down and see the cause for commotion, possibly shutting it down for a peaceful night of sleep. Coming down the stairs, Tsuburaba and Rin. After them, equally drowsy and confused, Kamakiri and Kaibara. Being engaged in his rival mode, Monoma ignored the sleepy heads. Think a waste, think, he got Kodai too, doesn't it make you mad? Of course I, I mean, w why would I be mad? I thought you liked her. I do, I mean, yeah, but it can't be helped, can it? And don't you want revenge for having your girl taken before you could? Doesn't that make your blood boil? Well, kinda, but I don't want a harem, why would I need one? It's an obvious power move to make, assert your dominance. Whoa, 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 hold on just a second. Why are you two shouting about harems? Honkuni, who just arrived, got himself into the conversation. Even half asleep, it was easy to pick these bits of the conversation. By now, Nairinjeki, Kajiro, and Fukudashi joined the group downstairs. Shishida was a heavy sleeper and his slumber could not be disturbed. With a full audience, Monoma took his time to shine. It is war then, you all, we're getting ourselves a harem. Needless to say, none of them understood what the blonde boy was talking about, and they all ignored the sound of metal scraping. Yeah, and I'm gonna fly to the moon on a unicorn. Monoma, it's yawn too late for this kind of joke. Rin said, rubbing his tired eyes. I am not joking, this is a task we must accomplish. Midoriya, that bastard, he clearly planned ahead since our class has more girls. Can someone please explain why I am awake and standing here? Kibera turned to Awase and Kiriwaro since Monoma would probably avoid the topic for a while, instead of getting straight to the point. Well you see, we went out to look for the girls and we kind of found them, in a compromising situation. Awase was looking for the words to ease this news for them. 
What kind of situation? Are they all right? Oh, I'm pretty sure they're more than all right, said the pitch black team. Ahem. Uh -huh. Well, the truth is, we found the girls and they, uh, I'm declaring war on 1A and Midoriya for making a harem out of my classmates. Each and every one of the boys looked at him as if he had grown a second head that shot lasers from its eyes. This shall not stand while I... Blam! Damn it! Silence. Apparently out of nowhere, Tetsutetsu slammed his arm on the wall he was leaning against. All the way back, and until now, the steel boy was awfully quiet. This was unheard of, even more considering his usually fired-up nature. However, the exploration group was so shocked with a glimpse from heaven, they got that no one really noticed this odd behavior. Now everyone had their eyes focused on the trembling teen, his skin shining as polished metal. He was grinding his sharp teeth with enough force to make rather loud noises now, and while it was mildly painful to hear, it didn't come close to the state of Tetsutetsu. Midoriya, that bastard. It was a mix of sadness, regret, anger, envy, and a tinge of disappointment, all tied together by this reality check. The other guys watched with wide eyes as Tetsutetsu got visibly angrier. And as if decided by fate, the door gently opened. Kendo was the first one and she froze in place. Her eyes scanned the room and stopped at the steel boy, who was now looking back at her. He looked so hurt, and the hole on the wall wasn't a good sign either. The others were lined after the ginger head, poking their heads out to try and see what was happening. Um, look, I know you have questions, but hear me out. Kendo, he didn't let her finish, marching up to the class rep and firmly grabbing her shoulders. Are you okay? Eh? Well, she didn't exactly expect this to be his first question, but Tetsutetsu had always been sort of protective with her. He did that to everybody he deemed a friend, but Kendo could see she was a special case, and after how the steel teen reacted when she revealed she was dating Midoriya, it became quite clear why. Are you hurt? Did he do something to you? I, I'm fine, Tetsutetsu, everyone is. What did he do? Does he have something against you? I swear, I'll beat that green-haired liar until... Tetsutetsu, stop, she said, pushing his arms away. He, of course, was confused, but Kendo quickly followed. We're not doing this. Doing what? This. This interrogation and round of assumptions and the consequential witch hunt that follows. Now, talking with the girls from 1A and Midoriya, Kendo learned how they reacted when they discovered he and Yuraraka were having sec. The current situation was much, much worse, 16 times to be precise. Not only were they caught in the act, but she was also supposed to be his girlfriend, and Kendo had to admit it was very uncommon to see a single guy with so many girls at once. Again, just by how the steel teen reacted, she predicted the direction this talk would take, and rather than have to clear the reputation of her beloved, the ginger head preferred to simply get over it and tell them the truth, regardless of any damage her image could take, so she took in a deep breath to still her heart. It is exactly what it looks like, Tetsutetsu. I, we all were, were all dating Midoriya at the same time, and doing some other things. In the end, she couldn't bring herself to openly say it, but it wasn't needed. Manoma already made it very clear to the boys what she was talking about. Needless to say, they were all shocked. Wait, so all of you? Subaraba scratched his head. With Midoriya, Rin was stuck with a dumbfounded face. Everyone had similar perplexed faces. The only exception was the boy in front of Kendo. He went from shocked to confused and then disheartened. Why? Why him? Um, I don't have a real reason aside from, I really like him. This must be hard for you to take. I know you, Erm. I understand how you feel, Tetsutetsu, sorry. The last thing Kendo wanted was to trample on his feelings, which she knew still lingered somewhere in him at best. Losing his metal layer, Tetsutetsu glanced at the other girls, who slowly entered the dorms, leaving Kendo's shadow. Why, all of you? Is he that special? He then turned to the ginger head. Is he that much better than me? Kendo felt an arrow pierce her chest. 
Never before she saw this person so saddened. It was almost as if Tetsutetsu didn't have this spectrum of emotions since he was always cheering everyone on and being full of energy. So this quiet Tetsutetsu in front of her was quite hard to handle without being full of guilt. She wanted to hug him like she would to comfort any other friend, but would this be the right thing to do? Would she hurt him even more while trying to help? That's not it Tetsutetsu, I would never compare you to him or anyone. You're an amazing person really. Never doubt this. I know you'll find someone special that appreciates you like I do, probably even more. You just need to keep looking forward. She was as gentle as possible with her words. Kendo meant everything she said, but even then she knew this would take some time to heal. Tetsutetsu seemed to be pondering over it for a while, then shoved his hands in his pockets, sighing and clicking his tongue. I still don't like it. He should just pick you after all. The grumbling showed he was still pretty mad about it, but at least he seemed to acknowledge her decision. Kendo thought she heard something along the lines of punching that sneaky green-haired girl magnet, but it didn't feel like it was an immediate problem. During this entire exchange, the rest of the class stood as spectators, and now that the show was over, their attention turned to the group of girls. Komori and Tsunatori felt particularly anxious, being under the gaze of their peers, while Shiozaki was going through all the shades of red. Since Kendo broke the ice, Takage took it into her hands to make things clear. That's it. Did you guys get the message, or do you want me to get the juicy details? They shook their heads vigorously. Anyone else has a problem with that? Well, coming from you, that's kind of expected, Nyernjeki said, and the boys nodded in agreement. Oi, what's that supposed to mean? Komori and Sunatori-chan are a surprise, though. I never thought they were, you know, into it. Kaibara said. Don't ignore me, what's that supposed to mean? No, no, isn't Shizaki the most surprising one here? Honkuni added, and all the eyes fell upon the vine girl, much to her embarrassment. A, as long as our love remains P pure, there are no problems for me. Ah, piss off, you lot. You wish you could be as good as him one day? Said the lizard girl. I think I'll pass. Just hearing about it makes this harem idea look very troublesome. Kamakiri said, turning around and going upstairs back to his room. Soon the others followed suit. Wait, wait, wait. Is no one else seeing how serious this situation is? Monoma watched incredulously as the boys left the common room one after the other. Like I said, I don't really care what they do with Midoriya or whoever as long as they're fine with it. That's not my problem. Kirwaro said as he walked past the blondie. You guys really don't get it, do you? This is clearly a challenge and I won't let one a hog all the glory awk. The blondie was cut mid-sentence by a swift chop on his neck. Drop it, man. You heard them. Tetsutetsu casually held Monoma by the back of his shirt. One final glance at the ginger head and he was off to his room, dragging the knocked-out blondie along. As the crowd dispersed, the girls also headed to their rooms. As they passed by, a waist stopped one of them for a moment. Ah, um, Kodai-san, how can I say? What Monoma said earlier did make him think about it. Despite a waste taking it as just a crush, he still felt something for the cold princess. When did you? Uh, when did you? Fall for Midoriya, she guessed his question, and she was spot on. After the League of Villains attacked Yue. Well, it makes sense, he saved your life after all. And he is pretty cute. I guess so, ha ha ha. And he is pretty hot. Ah, uh, sure. And having sec with him is really amazing. Okay, I got the message. This was a bit too much information. The black-haired boy sighed in defeat. He knew the most popular heroes were the ones with the flashy quirks. Not that he wanted to be one for the fame, but right now Oase felt like he never stood a chance against Midoriya. You are pretty too, Oase. Did he mishear something? Sorry, what? You are pretty too, Oase, Kodai repeated in the same emotionless voice as usual. You're a fun person to hang around with, and if you focus a little more on physical training, I'm sure you'll have a lot of girls after you. I would do so. Wait, really? 
what should he be more embarrassed for? His crush complimenting him or the idea of being surrounded by girls like the Emerald Teen was a couple of minutes ago. Yeah. If I wasn't completely taken by Midoriya, I would go out with you. Kodai and her bluntness. The good side of it was that you could always tell she was being sincere and Awase took it in a positive light. ISC. And that's basically how it went. Honestly, the reaction was less than I expected. Except for Monoma. I get him grumbling around from time to time. Kendo said. It doesn't sound that bad. And it's not. Aside from the odd glances now and then, everything is mostly the same. It can't be helped, I guess. The image of the mother of 1B has changed for good. They aren't talking behind your back, are they? The Emerald Teen began to enter protective mode. No, no, that's not it. And don't you worry that head of yours, we can handle it just fine. She tranquilized him. What I really miss is seeing you. I miss you too, Izu. Shut up, Sitsuna. Midoriya laughed as Kendo tried to stop Takage from embarrassing her by proxy. Despite this turn of events, his life didn't change much on the surface. If nothing, being able to openly say he loved his girls was pretty liberating. That's pretty cute, but are you sure you'll survive not having hot, wild sec with your lovely ladies every night? It was the voice in his head that he grew accustomed to hearing. Honestly, I think we could use that short pause. What if it becomes stale, you know? Oh, Izuku, that's not how it works. No? Well, not to me, at least. And knowing the girls, that's not the case either. Sec with you will never get stale because they love you. And because you're well endowed and an absolute beast in the sheets. H, how would you know that? Honey, trust me. I may be an imprint of my former self residing in your mind, but I still can recognize a powerful orgasm when I see one. Oh, okay, I get it. I don't need you M making me feel horny while I walk on the streets. Her light laugh sounded like clear bells as she faded away back to her front row seat. Well, maybe we should try getting a closer look at that sometime. Shaking his head, Midoriya tried to clear his head. The last thing he needed was a bulge in his pants as he met the top 10th pro hero of Japan. Speaking of which, here he was, right in front of the agency of the dragon hero. Needless to say, Midoriya was equally anxious and excited to work with a pro hero like Rukyu. He heard from Tsuyu and Yuraraka how she was even better in person. Yash, I'll give my best to. Ah, uh, Midoriya, so you accepted Rukyu's invitation, that's good. The Emerald Teen jumped out of his skin as someone appeared out of nowhere shouting his name. The voice, however, was a familiar one. Pado Senpai, I totally forgot you worked with Rukyu. The bubbly blue-haired girl approached him with a pout and puffed cheeks. She got a little too close, stopping inches away from his face and staring at his eyes for a while. At some point, Midoriya felt like he couldn't handle this awkwardness any longer. Um, senpai, is everything okay? Humu, Midoriya-kun, that's not nice of you to say. I was super looking forward to the hero work studies since Rukiu told me she invited you. Hato said, hands resting on her hips in a comical display of annoyance. I is that so? Yes, Midoriya didn't remember this small detail, and he also forgot about his senpai asking him out on a date. Rather, he hoped Hato would have dropped the idea altogether. Of course. The pout quickly turned into a bright smile and Hato was back to her usual bubbly self. Now let's go, we don't want you to be late on your first day working with Rukiu. And just like that, she held his hand and dragged Midoriya inside the agency, also gathering a lot of attention towards them like the pro heroes there watched them pass by, much to his embarrassment. Despite being on the top 10 of pro heroes in Japan, Rukiu's agency was relatively small, in the sense that she didn't have as many pros and sidekicks under her name. Most notably, the dragon hero was known for taking heroes in training to help them develop their fighting strength, so her office kind of worked as a temporary stage for many newly graduated heroes. That didn't bother her at all. On the contrary, Rukiu always felt happy that she had some influence in the growth of the next generations. 
Rukiyu-san, Rukiyu-san, Midoriya-chan is here. The blue net barged into the office, never letting go of Midoriya's hand. It's sorry for the intrusion, I'm M. Midoriya Izuku. He instantly entered his socially awkward mode since this was a totally new environment. Midoriya also had to keep his fan side in check. Tenth hero of Japan or not, that signature on his book could wait. Good morning, Hado. You seem more energetic than usual. The dragon hero said with a gentle smile on her face. Rukiyu had to admit, ever since Hado joined her office, not a single day was boring. Some of it came from the curious nature of the brunette, and she was glad to have her under her wing, even when the questioning became a little unhinged. Besides, she was a very competent hero already, with all the good qualities and a powerful quirk to back it up. Now, turning her focus to someone as promising as Hado. Good morning to you too, Midoriya-san. I want to thank you in advance for taking my offer. Let's see that you take something useful while you're here. Please, I should be thanking you for having me. It's an honor to be invited by one of the top ten. He said, making a polite bow. Don't be so hung up on titles, the ranking is more for the public image. The pro hero said, getting up from her desk and walking past the two students. Although, I do believe in giving credit where it's due. If the people think I deserve it, I'll do my best to meet their expectations. That's also why I invited you, Midoriya-san, or should I say, Deku, right? Having Rukiyu addressing him by his hero name gave Midoriya a warm feeling inside his chest. People were starting to recognize his efforts, so that meant he was making progress. More, I need to go even further. Yash, I will give my best. HMHM, someone is pretty excited to work Hado chirped by his side, as giddy as Midoriya was, if not more. Go change into your costumes now, we're going for a patrol. She will spend the mornings here while I'm at class, Aizawa said monotonously, giving a small push on the kid's back. We walked to the couch and climbed up, dangling her legs as she looked around. Can I see Deku now? While Ishido and Hagakure squealed at the cuteness emanating from Eri, Tsuyu got the rest of the instructions from their homeroom teacher. Ribbit, so while we're under house arrest, we'll look after Eri chan I'm taking care of her training, but I also have classes to lecture. I can't really ask Tagata to keep an eye on her during the morning, as he has normal classes beyond the hero course. So that leaves you girls as the next available option. Aizawa didn't see any problems in taking advantage of a situation they got themselves in to begin with. If they didn't want this, they wouldn't be literally F-seeking around the campus. Well, it's not like we can go anywhere else, Ribbit. Exactly. Luckily, the schedules for the hero work studies allow at least one of you to be here during the entire week. Also, Eri needs to interact with different people, but placing her with other kids her age is not safe yet and I imagine it would be overwhelming, so take good care of her. The scruffy man finished, taking his leave. Sure thing, sensei. Ribbit ribbit, Suyu croaked happily as having Eri around was always a good time. It also doubled down as a good way to pass the time while they were grounded for a month. Not having their beloved mop of green hair around was proving to be a hard task to endure already. Ni ni, Eri-chan, have you learned something cool yet? Ashido kneeled close to the gray-haired girl, beaming with happiness. The small girl pondered over it a bit, then gave an answer. Aizawa has a lot of apple pies. Eh? Both Iri and Ashido shared a confused look, though the former had different reasons. I don't really understand. Sensei is always asking me things like, if you have ten apple pies, and then I give you five more pies, how many do you have? But I didn't get any pies yet, and I don't know where Sensei keeps them. I look in the room already. Iri didn't seem bothered, she just didn't understand where all those pies were coming from. Meanwhile, Ashido was stuck between covering her mouth to prevent her laugh and having a stroke from the sheer adorableness of this precious kid. This is called a math problem, Iri-chan. It's meant to help you understand it better, but Sensei doesn't have real pies. Hagakure explained, petting the girl on the head. Awa, so I don't get any apple pies. 
We can ask Sado-kun to bake you one, Ribbit Tsuyu suggested, joining her friends around the cute girl. Really? Her eyes lit up like Christmas lights at the idea of eating an apple pie. Ever since Midoriya told her there were many forms of eating an apple, she got invested in looking for and tasting each and every one of them. Recently, Iri found out about pies, and it was currently her biggest interest. Make sure to study, and we can make it a reward for a job well done, ribbit ribbit. Ari would have run back to Aizawa's quarters if Ishido didn't hold her in place with a hug. It was really good to see her so excited about, about anything. You are very good with kids, aren't you, Tsu-chan? The invisible girl said. Well, I do have two younger siblings. So, do you want to play something, Iri chan the pink-haired girl looked as excited as the gray-haired one. Um, is Deku here? She asked shyly. Muscles ahem, Deku is out doing hero stuff for school. He won't return until afternoon. Ah, and where is everyone else? Like spiky hair Kun and sparky Kun? And that loud one too, she said, looking over the couch. They, uh, are at class right now. And why aren't you, Pinky-chan? The wonders of an inquiring, curious kid. Um, let's say we kind of made a mistake and we're grounded for a while. But hey, we'll be spending a lot of time together. It'll be fun. Ashido successfully deflected the question, also gaining a smile from Iri. A little shaky, but she was training so she could smile just like Deku and Lemillion. One thing to always keep in mind is your surroundings. An emergency or a crime can happen at any time, and the quickness to respond to them is crucial for a hero. The dragon lady explained as she walked across the streets, followed by the two students. You also want to know exactly where you are regarding civilians' present and potential hazards in the environment. For example, I can't change into my dragon form in narrow or crowded spaces. That limits my range of action a bit, but also makes sure I am most effective when needed. You can say it's a situational thing. On the back, Midoriya was furiously taking notes in his notebook, mumbling as he added his own observations to Rukiyu's experience. Meanwhile, Hado eyed him from the corners of her eyes, holding a tiny smile. Nejire Chan told me about a peculiar situation of yours, Deku. You're some sort of late bloomer, correct? The question dragged Midoriya out of his inner monologue. E.A.? Ah, yes. He put the notebook aside and raised a fist, focusing a little. Then, something akin to a string of some black material jutted out one of the openings in his gloves. This is called Black Whip. It's some sort of side effect from my quirk, I think. It was hard enough to explain how he only developed his quirk now, and the other quirk stored in one for all only added more complexity to this problem. Well, it's pretty common for the description of a peculiarity to change as the person understands its fundamentals better. Regardless, Nijair Chan said that, on the occasion where you awakened this side of your peculiarity, it went haywire. Yeah, it was super scary but also pretty cool. I was surprised that Midoriya had such a powerful quirk, but she turned to Midoriya, invading his space as she leaned closer to inspect the black thing coming from his glove. Why is it so small now? What happened to all those tendrils? Did you forget how to use it? Me, me, did you ask Hatsum san to modify your gear? Do you know how it works? Can you make more than one rope thingy? Why is it so small again? Nejair, one question at a time. Rukyu had to halt the blue net spree of questions as Midoriya was clearly overwhelmed. From what she heard about him, the guy wasn't exactly the most articulate person when it came to social skills, and having Hado on curious mode certainly didn't help. To top it off, it was a new side of his peculiarity that he would need to sort out as soon as possible if he wanted to keep up with his classmates. Rukiyu had a soft spot for kids, and she appreciated the amount of effort Midoriya seemed to put into covering the gap between him and everyone. He had to compensate for all the years the other kids had to experiment with their quirks while they grew up. For now, this is the best I can do without losing control or straining myself. I was thinking about how I can best use it to help me in fights, Midoriya said, staring at his hand in deep thought. 
it was obvious to the dragon lady that he felt at least troubled with his current predicament. Q for her advice if she could give any light to him. Honestly, we're not exactly on the same grounds regarding our peculiarities, but I can tell you this one thing. There is a best place and situation to use this side of your quirk. When it first activated, how was it? Well, I was trying to reach out to someone, but I was just too far, and then it activated. Midoriya didn't see that other inheritor of one for all again, and Nana Sen said that while she could somehow sense them somewhere, she couldn't bring them to the surface like she did all the time. It would be very helpful if he could talk to the original owner of the quirk. That sounds more like a tool than a weapon to me. While I'm sure you can incorporate that into your arsenal, I think it would be better if you trained using this side of your peculiarity as something to help you out, instead of another set of attacks. It's just my opinion though. Midoriya seemed to be in deep thought at her words. No, it makes sense. Whenever I learn a new ability, I instantly try to make it some sort of offensive, but I don't have many options to aid in rescues and other situations. How did I miss that? He was shocked at his lack of sight. Once again, Midoriya fell into the trap of emulating All Might too much. It's a common path to heroes with battle-oriented peculiarities. Don't beat yourself too much about it, Rukiu assured him, giving a gentle smile. There was no denying this kid was genuinely a hero in the making. She couldn't help but think if that was one of the reasons why Midnight and M.T. Lady were so invested in him. You probably have fewer chances of getting hurt that way, Hado said in a happy tone, but the green teen did take it as his senpai calling him out on his tendency to break a limb while fighting. When you look at it, so far every major progress Midoriya made was in order to prevent his arms from getting wasted. Why, you are right, senpai, he laughed awkwardly, scratching his head. Well, that's enough talking for now, we can discuss it later on if you want. We'll split here and you two cover the west area, then come around in a circle back to the office. Hi, they said together, then sprinted across the street to their patrolling zone. Are you going to stand there all day? Yayurazu asked without bothering to hide her annoyance, closing the book and her eyes in frustration as she held back the urge to smack the blondie with the heavy tome at hand. I'm fine here. Are you done reading for now? Himiko asked with innocence in her voice. I can lend you the book if you want. Nah, I'm okay reading with you, Momo-chan. The raven-haired girl felt her eyebrow twitch. But I insist, you looked really interested in the book. You haven't left my back for the past half hour. Just because she was under house arrest didn't mean Yayurazu couldn't study. As the co-leader of the study group of the class, she knew most of the subject's chronograms, so she could prepare herself and reduce the gap of contents she was missing out on. However, Himiko simply parked behind the couch where Yayurazu was sitting, leaned over, and apparently followed her reading. How come her very presence could be so frustrating? Yayurazu got up and headed to the kitchen, where Himiko followed her. She picked up a glass of water and drank it, again being mimicked by the blondie. As she opened the fridge to see if there were any snacks left, Himiko poked her head around to peek too, and the raven-haired girl felt an urge to slam the door shut so this creature would have her head stuck. Oh, for the love of, can you please back off? What? Don't you have anything better to do? Izuku is not around so, no. I already did my homework too. Do you want to see my notes? No, I don't want to see your notes, Yayurazu shouted, storming out of the kitchen, steaming like a kettle. Siro jumped to the side as she passed by him with a nasty look on her face, only to see the reason for such a look come right after her. Momo-chan, wait up. Don't Momo-chan me. I really don't want to be in her skin, said the tape boy with a sympathetic look. But Momo-chan, I'm bored to death here. And why should I care? Yayurazu asked harshly as she got up to her room. Don't be like that, Momo-chan. How about we call this a bonding activity, hmm? How about you stay away from me, she said, slamming the door of her room at the blondie's face. Aw, come on, you don't have to be so grumpy just because Principal Mouse cut your fun time with Izuku. 
The door quickly opened and Yayurazu poked her head out, glaring at Himiko as if she could shoot death beams with her eyes. She opened her mouth to say something, but it turned into a pout with puffy cheeks. Ook, how I hate this! And she closed the door shut again, not acknowledging the smug look plastered on Himiko's face. At the 1B dorms, a group consisting of Shiozaki, Yanagi, Kodai, and Sunatori were gathered at the Blondie's room. Their topic of talk, Sunatori's vast collection of manga. She took a few of her boxes out of her wardrobe, and her favorite series were all neatly organized on shelves in her walls. There was a considerable number of shelves compared to how her room used to be. I gotta say, Pony-chan, this manga is pretty good, Yanagi said, going for the next volume right away. Hee hee, I knew you would like Shiki. I'll see if my sis can send over my Junji Ito collection since you like horror so much. Another also has a good anime adaptation. The short girl said with glee, Midoriya and Kendo were completely right, it was amazing to finally be open with her friends about her hobby, and everyone was very accepting. Enthusiastic even. I don't know if I like this one a lot, Sunatori-chan. All these girls are devils, and the protagonist is a shameless pervert. Shiozaki gave the blondie the volume back. Under a lot of insistence, she read the first volume from beginning to end. Yeah, I thought so. Honestly, I kinda wanted to see how you would react to DXD fanservice, she didn't exactly hide the smile forming on her lips, as the vine girl did exactly what she expected, calling the girls in that manga a bunch of depraved devils. But isn't that ironic when we all date the same person, Kodai said, not looking away from her reading. K Kodai-san, please don't compare Izuku to this Issei or whatever. He doesn't think about bosoms every time, and he's not openly perverted. Still, it makes you think, doesn't it? How we're part of a harem? Doesn't it look like we came out of a manga or something? Yeah. Well, I'm not a big fan of DXD anyway. I just have them because it's a classic. Too much gratuitous fanservice to my taste, but I think you'll like this one more. It's called Black Cat. I made a cosplay for this girl on the cover once. Tsunatori said, handing the manga to Shiozaki. Oh wow, this girl with the angel wings, amazing, I would love to see it. Maybe another day, I didn't bring a proper dress for it, she said, scratching her cheek sheepishly. Speaking of clothes, Tsunatori-chan, any chances of you making a costume of this character for me? Kodai turned the manga around so Tsunatori could see, pointing at the character in question. Urza, huh? Hmm, I don't know, her battle armor has a lot of details, it would be a fun project for sure, but it also would be pretty time-consuming, not to mention a bit expensive. Then how about this one? Kodai then showed another page. That's honestly just a basic bunny girl outfit, the blondie pointed out. Do you think Izuku would like it? Oh, so this is why you want to wear it? Yes. She looked surprisingly committed to the idea despite her expression not changing much. Again, you had to look for the small details. If you don't mind me giving my opinion, Urza Scarlet doesn't match up with you a lot. Is it because of my bosoms? K. Kodai-san, Shiozaki intervened as the cold princess was on her way to remove her shirt. No, that's not it. How can I say this? Personality-wise, I think Kendo-chan would be a better fit, especially in her clear heart clothing said the blondie, picking up another volume, looking for a panel to show them. Isn't that just simple clothing instead of armor? Yanagi piped up. And why is she only using bandages to cover her chest? How shameless. Shiozaki followed up. Well, it's supposed to symbolize how she took down the walls around her heart, her armors, and it's also a battle suit focused on offensive power. Anyway, Kendo-chan would totally rock this one, don't you think? said the shorty, already excited with the idea. Hmm, you're not wrong, Kodai said. About that bunny girl, get up. Kodai-san. Tsunatori couldn't help but laugh at the flustered vine girl. Sigh, maybe one day we could make a cosplay night and have everyone wear something. I'm pretty sure Izuku would love it, Yanagi said, hinting at some wild fun time with the Emerald team. I, it doesn't need to end that way, but I won't lie, it sounds interesting. 
the duo of students walked by the streets with vigilant eyes, scanning the surroundings for any suspicious activity. One of them looked way more relaxed than the other, however. Nini Deku-kun, try not to be so tense. People will think there's a problem. Nejair said, her smile always present. Oh, sorry, I didn't notice. It's okay, I was pretty anxious during my first internships and work studies too. We have to always be alert, but also look like nothing is going on. She said, strutting a few steps ahead of him, chin raised and with a proud face. Then she spun around, walking backward. That way people will be more at ease when they see us and feel safe. That's what Mirio always does. Well, uh, the brunette inadvertently brought up a delicate topic. Um, how is Senpai doing? I didn't get to talk to him recently. Midoriya tried to approach it as smoothly as possible. He's doing fine, considering everything. Mirio was taking care of Iri-chan while Aizawa-sensei was busy with homeroom, but now he's back to keep up with the normal classes. He's always cheering Iri-chan on, you know. Well, it was to be expected. Not that they thought it was the only reason why Tagata would help Irai, but the possibility of recovering his quirk wasn't something to be ignored. It wasn't the focus nor his priority, but it was still there. In fact, Hato and Tamaki were probably more eager with this idea than Tagata himself. I see, as expected from Tagata Senpai. Despite knowing the blondie for a relatively short time, Midoriya already developed a sense of admiration for him. Perhaps because they both were connected to All Might in some way. Not only that, he could relate to Tagata in the sense that both had to work hard to get where they were. Midoriya placed himself way behind him, but still in a similar situation. It was only with his determination and efforts that Tagata transformed a troublesome quirk into a powerful one, and it was the same unyielding determination that saved Are. So Midoriya decided to carry on these feelings along in his mission. The will of Lemillion was one more thing he had to honor since Tagata was intended to be the next inheritor of one for all. Hee hee, you're doing that face again. Eh? What wa? Ww what face? When he broke from his inner thoughts, Midoriya found Hado looking at him straight in the eyes, but much closer than he was comfortable with. You know that I will give my best face whenever you're getting serious. She said with a bright smile, then pumped up a fist in the air. It's like, show me your motivation, or something. Ah, uh -uh, I never realized I did that. He answered, scratching his head. But you look really cute, even when you're all serious. See cute? Ni Deku, I was thinking. Now that we're technically working together, we could. Yeah. A high-pitched scream cut Hado and got everyone's attention. Both heroes in training instantly entered into high alert mode, looking around to find the source of the problem, and there it was, just across the street. Some random dude was holding a young woman, one arm around her neck and the other, which had the shape and looks of a lobster claw, threatening to clamp the poor woman's head. Let me go, please, she shouted in fear as the thug restrained her, his eyes darting left and right frantically. The civilians around all looked shocked at the scene unfolding, many of them recording with their phones. Some people walked away hastily, but a lot of curious eyes either stood where they were or straight up got near to get a better sight. Oi, don't get closer or she gets it, he threatened the increasing crowd, snapping the lobster claw. The sound it made only made the lady shout and squirm more. Let me go, I'll give you all my money, please don't hurt me shut up and stop struggling, and you all, I told you to back off. The crowd took a step back as the lobster criminal swung his claw around, but they still kept closing the circle as more people appeared. Okay, everyone, please calm down. We don't want to get anyone hurt here, right, Mr. Lobster? The attention gathered to the blue-haired girl entering the circle. By the costume, anyone could tell she was a hero, or at least one in training given how young she looked. Oi, brat, I said to back off, he said, pointing the claw at Nejair and snapping it. Please save me. And I told you to shut up already. Now the claw was around her head. Yah! Now, now, why don't you let her go so we can talk in peace, Nejair said, trying to de-escalate the situation. 
Don't mess with me, talking. Peace, all you heroes know to do is beat people to a pulp. Who gives you the right to punish people like me, huh? Well, what you're doing now is a crime. We're just making sure justice prevails and... Justice? Don't give me that crap. How is it fair that I get beaten up for stealing a purse when there are companies full of dirty money? I don't see you lot banging on their doors. Well, it's a bit more complicated than that. If you let this poor lady go, then we can talk about that and... Bullshit. The moment I let go of her, you'll try and beat me too. And you're just a brat. Did you even finish school? He then turned to the crowd, still keeping the claw around the young lady's head. Listen, this game is totally rigged. I can't find a job because of my quirk, but I bet this pretty face here has no problems at all. How is that fair? Heroes? Justice? It's people like that brat that makes the rules, and it's people like me that have to lower their heads and obey, or else we get thrown into a cell. Please, please let me go, I'll give you money, but please let me go. The poor lady was crying as she begged him. TCH, it must be really good to be born with a good quirk and a pretty face. Let's see how you go around with an ugly scar in it. Yeah. The crowd winced in shock as the claw opened. The young lady screamed in terror. Nejair gave the signal. Now, Deku. The lobster thug didn't understand. He had a cheap mutation, only in his left arm, but still, the claw was pretty strong, enough to break weak wood. So why didn't he hear the snapping sound? Oh, there it was, the reason. Something thin and black was wrapped around his lobster arm, preventing the inferior pincer from closing. Still, where did that come from? Wham! A punch straight to the face. He was lucky Deku just began training with his black whip. Using one for all to power that punch could cause the secondary quirk to go haywire again. But still, Midoriya was pretty strong on his own after all that intense training. Dazed by the punch and surprise effect, the lobster thug loosened his grip on the young lady, staggering to the side. Deku was quick to aid her as the shock left her on the verge of fainting. Senpai with a swift exchange of places, Deku jumped away to secure the civilians as Nejire finished the criminal. Well, to answer your question, Mr. Deuce Lobster, when you put someone innocent in danger, that's when we have to act. Nejire then did a simple uppercut backed up by her wave motion, one hand on her hips as she effortlessly sent the criminal into the air. For someone that could knock down villains with powerful gigantification peculiarities, this was less than an exercise. This dude didn't stand a chance, but a civilian was held hostage, so this problem required more finesse. This was one of the many lessons Rukuyu taught her. Speaking of which, the dragon hero arrived a few moments later along with a few police officers. At least someone in the crowd made an emergency call. Rukuyu approached the blue net, who was in the middle of a round of cheers and applause. It wasn't her primary intention, but she did put a good display of heroism. Despite that, she kept her composure and waved at the people with her bright smile. Good job defusing that situation, Nejire chan It was all teamwork, Rukiyu-san. I simply distracted Mr. Lobster over there while Deku sneaked up and immobilized him. Her smile shone brighter as she pointed back at the green teen, currently occupied tranquilizing the young lady. Are you really okay? Does it hurt somewhere? I feel like fainting a bit and my heart is racing, but I'm fine. Thanks to you. She said, slowly getting on her feet with his help. No need to thank me, miss. Besides, it wasn't only me. He said with pride in his eyes. I can see we're in good hands with the next generation, and you look pretty cute too. Ah, T thanks. Before Midoriya had the opportunity to show his impression of a tomato, he got pulled around by Hato. Good job, Deku. You were amazing. You too, senpai. You managed to keep it cool the entire time. Both teens said, equally excited about the job well done. Congratulations to you too. Just don't forget to fill in the reports to the police until the end of the day, Rukiu said. Yeah, you really don't want to miss on that, Deku, said the Blunette, laughing awkwardly. The sun was about to set at the Wana dorms. 
Iri already left with Aizawa, and right now the girls were sitting on the couch, next to each other, legs and arms crossed. Not only that, they shared the same expression of annoyance and distaste for the blondie standing in front of them, and even more for the request she just made. Come on, let me in. No, Yuroraka answered again, plain and simple. I'll be a good girl. I promise I'll behave. No. Can't I just join temporarily, like an experience? No. Um, Achako-chan, you're not making this very easy for me. No, and that's final. The brunette emphasized, getting up with a huff, but before she could take more than two steps, Himiko jumped at her, sliding down as Yuraraka struggled to go to her room while dragging the inconvenience incarnated. Give me a break, Ochako-chan, I feel lonely all the time without Izuku around, I don't have anyone else to go. That's your problem, and let go of me. Please let me in, Ochako-chan, she whined, being dragged on the floor, holding on to Yuraraka's ankles as the brunette forced her way upstairs. I already said no. Momo-chan, help me out here. Get lost the raven-haired girl said as she watched the scene unfold along with the others. It would be mildly funny if it wasn't Himiko. Please, 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 I'm begging you, Achako-chan. Can you shut up and release me already? Yuraraka had to hold on to the handrail so she could push herself up the first steps of stairs. Let me in, let me in. Oh my god, fine. The loud burst caught everyone by surprise, be it for the volume of Yuraraka's voice or the answer itself. Even Siro and Takoyami, who were in the kitchen, poked their heads around the corner to see what was happening. Meanwhile, the girls on the couch seemed pretty shocked. Wait for real? Himiko lifted her head, eyes sparkling with joy. Ugh, yes, you can join our study group, said the brunette, pinching the bridge of her nose and groaning in deep frustration. Why? Why would she want so badly to join them? Just to get on her nerves? Or was she really feeling lonely? Either way, by now Yuraraka knew just how stubborn and persistent Himiko could be, and if she kept saying no, the annoying blondie would continue asking. And asking. And asking until the end of times rather, until Yuraraka lost every fiber of patience in her being. At that point, a crime would be committed, she was sure of it. Well, there was one tiny silver lining in this self-inflicted torture. If Himiko was being her absolutely infuriating self around them, then she wasn't doing the same around Midoriya, and that was something that had been concerning the gravity girl lately. How close she managed to get to him, and how Midoriya seemed to tolerate her presence. She didn't like to second-guess the love of her life, but something inside her told Yuraraka this wasn't right like the chills she would feel when some of the girls talked to him back then. Regardless of it, having Himiko enter yet another circle of their lives was kind of mortifying, but this was a sacrifice Yuraka was willing to make for the sake of her beloved Deku, which she hoped he was doing fine out there, being a hero and all. For a brief moment, her brain signaled that she was forgetting something. It felt important, but she couldn't put her finger on it. Actually, she couldn't focus properly because Himiko just jumped up from her position on the floor, cheering and hopping in place as she hugged Yuraraka. Yes, 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 we're finally doing best friends stuff together, Ochako-chan, hehe. <laughs> we're not best friends, we're not friends, we're not even acquaintances. Back off before I kick you into the sky. Okay, okay, baby steps, got it said the blondie, releasing Yuraraka's frame as if she was a hot iron bar. Perhaps she could actually get angry enough to generate heat. Still, I'm looking forward to that. I've been taking a lot of notes in class so you girls don't miss everything. Well, bye-bye. And just like that, Himiko left the room, with the intense stares of the girls aimed at her back. Nevertheless, she walked with a spring in her feet and hummed happily as she went upstairs, Yuraraka covered her face with both hands, activating her quirk, and as she floated up, the brunette screamed, muffling part of it with her hands. The sentiment was shared by the others. Takoyami and Siro looked at each other, then went back to mind their own business. Sorry for keeping you here at this late hour, Deku Nejire chan There's something in particular that I have to address while we're at the start. 
It's okay, Rukyu-san. To be honest, I kind of have some, uh, extra free time for a while. Midoriya answered. By his side, Hado swung back and forth on her feet with a happy face. This wasn't exactly news to her, but she did wonder what was the reason this time. Yoratsuma. An energetic voice got their attention. It was quite familiar to Midoriya, but he usually heard it in the news, answering interviews. Always bold and confident, to the point some would call it arrogance, but the numbers didn't lie. She was a very effective pro-hero. Maruko, he exclaimed in surprise as the tan-skinned lady made her way across the office, clad in her hero costume and holding a grin. You're late, Maruko, again. The dragon hero said, shaking her head. Sorry about that, some losers were trying to rob a bank, and it turned into a car pursuit and then a car crash. A lot of stuff happened, but I kicked them into jail. Knowing you, it couldn't have taken more than ten minutes of action, Rukiu replied. Well, I kind of forgot we had a meeting after that, so I went back to patrolling. She said without apparent worry about missing out on that appointment. Maruko, I know you're used to doing things your way, but we're a team now. Or at least that's the intention. Wait, a team? Midoriya, who was overflowing with the excitement of meeting another great pro hero in person, looked even more shocked than with her arrival. It was well known that the bunny hero Maruko worked completely alone. No agency, no sidekicks, no partnerships, no teams, which was becoming a sort of trend recently. Needless to say, Midoriya was equally thrilled and surprised, as he would be watching in the first role the formation of the very first hero team Maruko took part on. Yes, this is the topic I wanted to address. For a period probably short, the dragon lady quickly glanced at her friend. Maruko and I will be forming a small team along with a couple more pros. Really? That's so cool! Midoriya was trying to contain himself to not go full geek mode, but it was obviously a failing attempt. Meanwhile, next to him, Hato laughed at his antics, her eyes never leaving the green teen twinkling with excitement. Fufufu, I think I never saw him like this before. Cute. She said to herself, widening the smile crossing her lips. Wait, aren't you the kid that broke their fingers at UA's sports festival? The bunny hero took notice of the bundle of positive energy next to Rukiu. She wasn't good with names, though. Midoriya cringed at the mentioning of his early stunts. It was a little worrisome to him that he was more known for breaking his own body in fights. Probably not the best type of message to have attached to your image. H. Hi, M. Midoriya Izu. I'm Hado Nejire, and this is Midoriya Izuku, and our hero names are Nejire Chan and Deku. Ni nee, ni, nee, Maruko san, why are you making a team with Rukiyu san? Did you change your opinion? Can you hear better with your bunny ears? Can I touch them? Will you open an agency now that you're. Nejire? Rukiyu playfully smacked the blunette in the head, signaling her to hit the brakes on the questioning train. As for the tanned woman, she stepped forward and looked closer at Midoriya. Even if she was quite shorter than him, he couldn't help but feel under some pressure with her intense stare, fierce and bright red eyes measuring him from head to toe for a couple more seconds before she backed off from his personal space, allowing him to breathe again. Then she flashed a grin, still looking at him, one hand on her chin. Was there something on him that asked for that deep analysis? Midoriya, Izuku, huh? Heh, it was a hell of a stunt you pulled at the festival. And if I'm not mistaken, you also fought that muscle villain after the warp incident at UA, he couldn't confirm, but Maruko seemed to grin even more and squint her eyes a bit as she kept staring. Why, yes, although both occasions ended with not-so-good results, he said, scratching his cheek bashfully, so she also knew about that. That was kind of surprising. He didn't expect someone like Maruko to know that since she didn't do recruiting of heroes in training. From her place next to him, Rukiu crossed looks with Maruko, and the dragon hero did her best to send that what-are-you-doing kind of face, to which Maruko answered with a smirk. Rukiu didn't like that much. Nah, it happens. You'll get the hang of it with time. I already knew you, Rukiu's protege. Maruko said, pointing at Hado, but still taking a glance at Midoriya now and then. 
You have a good crew under your wings, Tatsuma. I do believe they have a lot of potential, and their feats only back it up. Well, she couldn't really speak for Midoriya yet, but Hado had been working with her since her second year, and she developed a lot since then. It was a small source of pride for the dragon hero. Potential, right, I can see that. Well, now that this is explained, I'm heading out. See you tomorrow or something, Tatsuma, said the bunny hero, spinning on her feet and walking away as casually as she came in. She halted at the door for a second, then turned her head around a little. Her eyes seemed to gleam like shiny rubies. Show me what you've got. I can't wait, Deku. The grin and the look in her eyes sent a shiver down his spine. Was that a challenge or something? She's usually like that, don't worry, Rukyu said, trying to tranquilize the green teen, but it kind of had the opposite effect. Maruko-san is so cool, don't you think, Midoriya-chan? Hado asked the mildly stunned boy, also invading his personal space similarly to Maruko. Ah uh ah, -uh, yes, no wonder she's in the top ten of Japan. If they made an international ranking, I bet she would still be pretty high up. The ranking system is more for the public image, and in a way, so is this temporary partnership. The streets are getting more and more criminals, and people aren't feeling as safe. Without All Might around, we have to provide them with this sense of safety in his place. Rukiu told them as she walked both students out of her office and to the train station. She always made sure the students under her wings were delivered safely, even if they could take care of themselves. Her words held much more meaning and weight to Midoriya than she knew. The pro heroes were taking on their hands the mission of keeping the legacy all might alive. Midoriya was the one with the task to carry it on further. Oblivious to his surroundings for a while, Midoriya didn't notice the slightly troubled expression Rukiu held, despite her best efforts to hide it. She did steal a glance or two at the Emerald Teen on the way to the station. Hado, she noticed, didn't bother being so discreet, as she didn't really move her eyes from the boy walking next to her. The blunette had a wide smile crossing her lips. He looks so cute. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through What If Everyone Gets Obsessed With Deku and Harim? I hope you found it as intriguing and thought-provoking as we did. A big shout-out to Guy Number 23 for crafting such a compelling story. Don't forget to check out their profile on fanfiction.net for more amazing works the link is in the description below. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to What If Deku 2 for more fascinating explorations into the world of fanfiction and fantasy. Your support helps us create more content like this, and we're always excited to hear your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section. See you guys in the next video.